allow House members on their amendments to lobbying legislation. The Rules Committee decides which amendments will be allowed on the House floor tomorrow when debate begins. This is just under four hours. The uh, Rules Committee will come to order. We are here for consideration of H.R. 4975, the Lobbying Accountability and Transparency Act of 2006. Uh, we all know that over the past several months, the issue of uh, ethics reform has been a high priority for us. We've had uh, obviously very serious problems that have impacted both Democrats and Republicans on the issue of <coughs> lobbying and ethics. And it is for that reason that Speaker Hastert asked me to work in a bipartisan way, reaching out to outside organizations, to Democrats and Republicans in this institution, to work with our colleagues and the other body. And I'm um, very happy uh, to have had the opportunity to do that. Over the past several months, this committee has held three original jurisdiction hearings. Five different committees have been uh, involved uh, in this uh, in this process and have reported uh, bills and again for the past several months have uh, gotten lots of recommendations and lots of ideas from a wide range of people and I very much appreciate having had the chance to work with uh, both my Democratic and Republican colleagues on this. Um, we are anxious to move ahead with this legislation because since uh, it is a bill it will be moving through the uh, House to uh, a House-Senate conference, and we look forward to having that uh, measure come back. And obviously, I should say that uh, clearly not everyone will be happy with every provision that is in this measure, but I believe that if we are serious about the issue of institutional reform, and I'm very proud to have been involved in reform issues for most of the time that I've uh, served here, I believe this is our opportunity to do that. So uh, let me uh, call as our first witnesses uh, the uh, gentleman from California who is on the Judiciary Committee, Mr. Lundgren. And uh, I know that he has an amendment and will be uh, participating with uh, Mr. Miller. And uh, we welcome both of you. And let me say that uh, we will, without objection, enter into the record any prepared statement that you have. And I actually uh, have just uh, I now have this power here to turn the microphone on, and so we've just done that. We have this new technology here, and I think I've done it correctly so far. Okay. So please, Mr. Lundgren, proceed. And uh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the chance to be here. I uh, congratulate you for the work that you've been doing. Um, this is something that uh, both Democrats and Republicans need to address. I'm pleased to be sitting here with uh, the gentleman on my left, uh, Mr. Miller. We've been working on an amendment <clears throat> Uh, along with other members on both sides of the aisle. Apparently, uh, I, think that's I don't know if, the, if is, is it working over there for you, Phil? Uh, the chairman, it actually is working. Uh, it's coming through this paper. It is. Oh. Well, I don't think you could get too much closer. We'll swallow it. We'll put your... Why don't you just speak up a little, Dan? Yes, I know I, you. Can, I, I, know, I, am, I know that. Uh, you know I've been you known for being well. soft-spoken, yeah, so exactly. I will uh, try and uh, change okay. that. At the same time, I am concerned about the potential impact the bill has on activities of 401c3 uh, organizations, which have no connection with the underlying purpose of HR uh, 4975. Um, we have crafted an amendment, which we hope would be made in order, which would allow members of Congress to participate in privately funded travel paid for by 501c3 nonprofit organizations if other conditions are met. The funding of the travel cannot originate in whole or in part from a registered lobbyist. Lobbyists would be prohibited from traveling with members or employees on the trip. The source of the funding would have to be disclosed to the committee on standards of official conduct. The clerk of the house would post the itinerary of the trip on a public internet site both before and after the travel occurred, with a limited exception, and this was a recommendation of uh, Mr. Berman, 
uh, where national security or safety of an individual would be jeopardized if that information uh, were out. That is, if you met with uh, a dissident in a particular country, um, and the judgment would be that that information getting out would jeopardize that particular individual. Finally, the amendment would require that the um, that the uh, Committee on Standards of Official Conduct would set forth a proposal on how to deal with other travel in future Congresses. I understand the concern about travel. Uh, I understand the abuses of travel, but we're trying to craft something which we think um, gets us out of that problem and at the same time allows a continued valuable contribution to the education of members. Uh, for instance, it could be sponsorship by a nonprofit of a trip to examine famine in, in uh, Central Africa. It might involve travel to the Middle East to gain a better understanding of the volatile events there. Um, and with all due respect, the current language of H.R. Uh, 4975 would restrict somebody like me from accepting an invitation of my alma mater, Notre Dame, to go and give their commencement address and have them pay for it. But if I were um, invited by Michigan State University, which I'm not uh, a graduate because it's a public institution, I'd be allowed to do that. It just doesn't seem to make sense uh, to do that sort of thing. I will confess that when I was here my first time around for 10 years, I rarely ever traveled. I thought there was a problem with travel. I thought it was a concern. I thought that, frankly, my constituents wouldn't support it. Being absent for 16 years and reflecting back on my previous experience, I realized that I shortchanged myself and my constituents by not taking advantage of travel, Codell and otherwise. Not that you do it unnecessarily or extensively, but it does add to our um, overall information. Uh, the underlying purpose of the uh, important reform legislation is, I think, not advanced by Section 301 as currently written. I think this institution of the People's House is greatly enhanced uh, by the type of informed judgment which equips uh, each and every one of us to make. Nonprofit educational organizations play and continue to play an important role in raising the skill sets for members with respect to different issues. And so I would just say we've tried to reach across the aisle, both sides of the aisle, looking at this. We've tried to come up with something that uh, takes care of the genuine concerns, but at the same time does not unnecessarily straitjacket it. I know the underlying bill says we have a moratorium until December. I've been informed by Heritage Foundation, for instance, if that moratorium were in effect, they would not be able to go forward with the um, orientation program they have for new members. Similarly, there'd be a question whether Harvard could do that. Uh, without judging as to the merits of either of those programs, it seems to me that's not what we really want to do here. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, I hope this amendment would be made in order so that it might be considered by the... Thank you very much, Mr. Lundgren. Mr. Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and uh, my colleague, Mr. Lundgren, has spent a great deal of time on this, and it's been a pleasure to work with him. He's explained it to you. Essentially, what we're saying is that uh, uh, we would allow travel by 501c3s, but there would be full disclosure uh, to the uh, Committee on Ethics, and it would all be done prior to the trip. It would be posted prior to the trip. The itineraries would have to be described, and, and members would have to be fully prepared to justify that travel uh, uh, to, the, to the public, to their, to their uh, constituents. Uh, the reason we, we take this outside of the moratorium is that many of these organizations plan trips uh, for, the, for the congressional breaks for that period of time. They make financial commitments that they have to, they, they have to make now. Uh, we all uh, understand that this is, this is uh, an effort uh, by organizations for the continuing education of the Congress, whether it's the Heritage Foundation, the Aspen Institute, APAC, uh, uh, the North-South uh, uh, Dialogue, uh, uh, the German Marshall Fund. These, these, are, these are essentially organizations that have a long history of involvement uh, with the with the with the with the continued uh, uh, education of the uh, of the Congress on a whole range of uh, of issues, both uh, both in foreign affairs and in, in domestic affairs, and also the whole human rights community that very often uh, takes a few members uh, at different times uh, to look at human rights problems all around the uh, all around the world, uh, and it's been participated in equally by uh, by members of both parties. I along. I agree with Mr. Lunger, and I think it's absolutely crucial to the discharge of our duty. I know you've received extensive testimony by organizations that would be impacted uh, uh, on the whole range of issues, so we need not go into Good. that. You've listened to them. They've given you their views and their programs, and I would hope that this amendment would be made. Well, thank you uh, both very much for your, uh, for your thoughtful testimony. Let me just say one thing in response to, uh, to your, uh, your comments here, Dan. 
And I've just spoken to, uh, to Mr. Hastings about this, and I've spoken to Mr. Berman. As you know, uh, there has been a lot of difficulty over the past several months um, with uh, Mr. Hastings working with now the former ranking minority member of the Committee on Ethics, Mr. Mollahan, who has just recently stepped aside, and I've spoken with Mr. Berman. This action under this bill could be taken uh, tomorrow. A recommendation could come forward from the Ethics Committee tomorrow, which would completely allow for full disclosure and pre-approval on travel. And so I just, to, you said you used the December 15th date, and in the legislation we say by December 15th, but I, I think that there is a great deal of hope now, and I know that, that Chairman Hastings of the Ethics Committee shares that, uh, working with our fellow Californian, Mr. Berman, who's going to be the new ranking minority member with the prospect of dealing with that. So I, I appreciate uh, your coming forward with this, and I think it's a very, very, uh, interesting notion, and obviously it's been, been part of this debate as we've proceeded. Mr. Hastings. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, uh, I just want to ask a question as uh, you have described your, uh, your amendment. Uh, it, it sounds to me like you are carving this out especially for nonprofit organizations. Uh, I, 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 like the, I like the aspect that talks about pre-notification uh, pre, uh, ahead of time itinerary, and the question is why would you limit that just to nonprofits? And let me explain why I asked this question. Because of the nature of my district on a personal level, Dan, you talked about uh, going to uh, Notre Dame, and there's probably the same number of people that are graduates of Notre Dame that are interested in the policy issue I'm going to explain, so it's equally the same, and that is cleaning up nuclear waste. I get invited, uh, in the time that I've been in Congress, probably three or four times, to go to a resort where they have a big confab as to uh, uh, that issue, and I've been uh, privileged to have been invited to go there. It is a for-profit uh, organization, however, that, uh, that holds this. Now, I have no problem of putting my itinerary on the record because I typically fly in there late at night and leave the first thing in the morning, even though it's a resort area, and I have no problem defending that. So my question is, is, is uh, why, what, was your, what was your reasoning behind carving out just nonprofits rather than allowing everybody as long as you have the pre-notification ahead of time? Well, my, I can't speak for Mr. Miller, but, but my reasoning was that it would probably be the least controversial that we could start with. Uh, this recognizes the continuing uh, obligation of the committee on ethics to make that determination with respect to others. Uh, I personally have no problem in that regard. I think sunshine, I think uh, putting the spotlight on this information, getting it out early, will allow our constituents to make that decision. Uh, frankly, it was uh, how could I uh, get an agreement it was the least controversial that made the most sense and for which there was an institutional memory <coughs> history in this house. Um, I was thinking primarily, I guess, of the orientation programs, of those various programs that have been created to help us here, uh, for which there's very little disagreement. Uh, but if you're asking would I support what you have just said, yes, I would. I might also say, just for the record, I think this is the first time in my 12 years that I've ever had something called the Lundgren-Miller Amendment. Um, so I was trying to keep it as uh, broad as we possibly could. I think my answer is essentially the same, that this looked like the easiest carve-out in a sense that there's a history here of, of these organizations without a direct, uh, I don't want to say so much interest, but in the case of whether or not they would be direct beneficiaries of any specific legislation. I agree. I think that, that, you know, I have the same situation. I have six oil refineries, and they say, do you want to go look at this in the Gulf of Mexico? Do you want to go here? Do you want to go there? I think that's important to my constituents in that. I think we have to come up with, but it may be somewhat stickier uh, in the sense that they would that they have direct interest in what Congress does in, in, in that sense. And But I think it's going to end up sort of looking like some kind of, you know, disclosure down the road on that. But it, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a stickier problem. It's a stickier well, problem. let me, I mean, I, I, I appreciate uh, your answers, and, and uh, I think the key thing here is not so much who the entity is that's, that's sponsoring the trip, because uh, nonprofits, uh, as we had testimony here, uh, lobby just as hard as for-profit corporations. I mean, it's, it's all the same. To me, the key issue here is how you do the pre-notification. There are security issues and, uh, that, that need to be addressed, but it seems to me if you can get through that pre-notification and, and this era of instant uh, communication, 
uh, then believe me, the market will take care of that. I mean, if your constituents uh, don't want you to go look at oil rig, you'll hear about that, you know, the week I, beforehand. I couldn't agree more. I think and, members will have to, will, will be making some interesting decisions yeah. because <laughs> Uh, the disclosure here will really be the key. You'll have to look at that and say, is that something I want to participate in and can I defend it? And if that's the bottom line, have at it. it may, it's going to be different for, as we know, for okay. different members in different circumstances. Well, I, 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 I say that, I, I bring this up. I know you're talking about your specific amendment, but in either case, the, uh, uh, this bill passes. Uh, uh, the Ethics Committee is going to be charged with uh, with looking at this, and, and I appreciate your, your income. Maybe we'll have some time. As the Chairman uh, Dreyer did say, uh, notwithstanding this bill passing or not, uh, the, the committee could come up with it. And it, with, you know, your your response to my questions in this in a broader sense, I think, is very, very helpful, and I appreciate if it. If the committee comes up with this tomorrow, I'll be happy to withdraw my amendment. Okay. I appreciate that. Mrs. Slaughter. No questions. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Cole. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. First, I, uh, as I think you both know, I'm very sympathetic with uh, what you're trying to do. And uh, um, a couple of, of questions, because there is some merit to working through the Ethics Committee. Uh, you know, it's, it's possible that uh, this vote uh, on this bill will not be an uncontentious vote and that there will be a strong partisan division. Uh, on the vote. Um, so, uh, Mr. Miller, if, this, if the amendment were in the bill and the bill was essentially as it is today, two big hypotheticals, obviously, would it be a bill you could support with the amendment or? Well, you, uh, I <laughs> support the amendment, as they say. Uh, <laughs> if the bill's as it is, I would not probably support it. Okay. The, and again, I understand this is not meant to be, uh, Chris, I think that's one of, uh, one of the concerns uh, of the authors of the bill been explained to me is that if something actually goes through the ethics committee where we have a 5-5 balance where I think we have a very reasonable chairman and a very reasonable ranking member, uh, uh, that might actually legitimize the process much more than something that's approved in a bill. Even if we had no debate over that particular provision, uh, you know, I think later on folks might look back and sort of Question. That way, we would have arrived at a consensus by by necessity uh, between the two parties uh, on anything we do. Uh, I, how I, would you respond to that? No, I mean I appreciate what, what you're saying, uh, uh, and uh, you know, and, uh, and uh, uh, that that's one way to do it. Obviously, we're looking for some certainty because in a number of instances, we know that the planning is there, and you and the chairman would have to have to sort that out with the with the ethics committee. I, I'd say as a sidebar, uh, one of the values, as many of us know, to, to some of these trips is, is being put in a situation with people you would, might not ordinarily get to know. And uh, uh, having a chance to be with Mr. Cole on a, on a couple of these uh, efforts uh, you know, has allowed us to have a friendship we wouldn't have otherwise in the Congress, probably given our schedules and the, and the way we, we, we go around here. Uh, so I think that, that uh, uh, you know, this is very similar, I think, better than what the Senate arrived at. It's, it's, it's very similar, strengthened and changed a little bit from what the, the Democrats introduced in their legislation. And so I think that, you know, there is, you are arriving at that consensus that you're looking for uh, on, this, uh, uh, on this particular amendment. I think on, on both sides of the aisle, there's been a lot of expressions of support uh, for, this, uh, for this effort. And uh, that's why the Rules Committee has to sort it out, I guess. Yeah. Uh, one, if I may, one other question. Then, uh, uh, would either of you still? I mean, I think there's still a real effort to find middle ground here and work on a couple of things. So, if if some of the people that still had a concern, uh, would you would you be amenable to talking to them to, just to continue the discussion? You might arrive at something you could uh, you could still be supportive of, but might be a little bit different than what you're presenting. Is it kind of this? It you're said you're still open. Sure, to it? Kind of yeah. Yeah, I, again, I'm, I'm trying to. Before the bill comes up, you're talking about. Absolutely. I, I, I'm always sure. willing to talk. Okay. Uh, could, could I just say one, one yes, thing? Yes, sir. I mean, I know the maelstrom of, of political um, debate and partisanship uh, that surrounds this issue, and I, I, I'm no babe in the woods. I, I would just say, with respect to this, one of the concerns I have about this institution is we're not enough family friendly, we're not enough member friendly, we're not enough of concern about ourselves and how we respect one another. And I say that with all due respect, having been here and been gone for a while. I would hope this is one area where we could all work together, despite all those other things.
because I really do think it goes to the question of how we treat one another and how we respect one another and how we get to know one another. Uh, Mr. Miller talked about trips, and maybe to the outside world they don't understand that. But we always should remind ourselves that politics is policy, but it's also people. And we have so little opportunity to get to know one another around here. And one of the additional aspects of these trips that is in addition to the fact that we learn a lot about the subject matter is that we learn one another. And I would just hope that we could at least make this small step in that direction. Given the fact there's going to be a lot of other fights, and I understand that this isn't going to resolve it, maybe this is one little bit of step towards showing that we can work together on some of this stuff. Well, I, I am very sympathetic to what the gentlemen are trying to do. I frankly want to compliment you both for a, a, an excellent uh, good faith effort. Uh, I tell you that if, uh, if, we're, if this uh, or something akin to this is not in amendment form and we end up going through the Ethics Committee, I certainly be working with Chairman Hastings very carefully and, and Ranking Member Berman to try and make sure that we get the problem resolved uh, immediately or, or as rapidly as possible. But again, I appreciate the gentleman's effort. Thank you, Mr. Cole, and we appreciate your service on the, uh, on the Ethics Committee as well. Before I go to Mr. McGovern, I just wanted to uh, ask um, Mr. Miller if we were to see this amendment made in order and pass on the, on the floor, uh, would you be inclined to support this legislation? And the reason I ask that is that we know that, uh, unfortunately, while I have tried my darndest to reach out and work with a wide range of Democrats and outside organizations on an awful lot of these issues, some are arguing that the bill has not gone far enough, some are arguing that it has gone too far, and I guess I would just wonder uh, whether or not you would be inclined to support the legislation if, in fact, this were to be successful so that we can continue in this quest, just as you and Mr. Lundgren have, to recognize that this is a, an institutional issue. This is not a partisan issue at all. It's an issue that does need to be addressed in a bipartisan way, and I'm going to continue to try my doggone just to make that happen. Well, I haven't seen the, the final language, right. but what I know of the bill, I do not believe that I would support it uh, uh, with or without this, this language at, at, this, uh, at this current time, as you know. Uh, we offered legislation which was, you know, covered a greater range of subjects about how the House is run and that is part of, uh, part of mm -hmm. what we consider to be ethics reform and right now that's mm -hmm. not reflected uh, in, in the legislation. But as I said at the outset, though, clearly this is legislation that will be going to conference and this is really just the first step in, uh, in a process and it is our opportunity to deal with the issue of institutional reform. Thank well, you. thank you very much for that. Mr. McGovern. No, I just say that um, I support your amendment. I think it's a, a good compromise. Uh, my colleague, Elsie Hastings, um, when we were having the markup of the Rules Committee, actually offered an amendment to try to set up some sort of a pre-approval process for travel um, with, the, with the House Ethics Committee. It was turned down on a, on a party vote, unfortunately. But I think that's ultimately, in the long run, how we're going to resolve this. But it seems to me that where there's the least amount of controversy is over the nonprofit travel that you're talking about. Um, I, you know, I went on both retreats when I got elected to Congress. I went on the Harvard retreat, and believe it or not, I went on the Heritage um, Foundation retreat. They called three times to see whether it was for real. Um, <laughs> but uh, I went and I found it to be a very uh, helpful and, and educational experience. And I think, uh, you know, members should, new members should especially have that opportunity. There's value in that. And quite frankly, I think um, most of the American people, I mean, their concern about travel has nothing to do with, um, you know, uh, orientation retreats or if you're going to go to a, on a human rights trip or if you're going to go to do something on behalf of your district. Their outrage is over the, the trips where you go golfing in Scotland or where you go, you know, you, where you're on some extravagant trip where there is no uh, discernible uh, value to those trips. And, uh, and I think we should be able to work our way through all that. But to, to just kind of ban travel outright and say, oh, we're going to, you know, we'll, 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 we'll punt and we'll deal with it, um, you know, later, I don't think is the right way to go. And I think if your amendment is made in order, I'm, I'll tell you, I bet you a majority of the, of the House will vote for it. Because I think most people uh, agree with what you what you agree that there's some value to that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Longwood, and Mr. Miller. I uh, I support this amendment, and uh, I want to comment on what you said, Mr. Longwood. Um, my husband and you were elected the first time you were elected, and uh, I must say, um, the people in that class did get together an awful lot, and our kids got to know each other, and the wives got to know each other, too. And we did go on trips, not as much at that point in time, because we all had little kids at the time. But I have to say that it was an opportunity for everybody to get to know each other. And 
probably these trips are the best opportunity today to do that. And um, these 501c3 nonprofit trips are are valuable, not only because of the policy. They're very intense, too, by the way. I, I've been on a couple of them. and. Uh, you're really sitting there learning or you're running around studying and so there you are and um, not much time other than that, uh, you know, maybe a dinner to just interact with each other and it's, it's a basis of some friendships and understanding and I think that is um, very necessary in today's Congress. Um, I believe that we have to start somewhere and this is probably the most non-controversial way. I think there's general agreement on both sides of the aisle this is valuable. Um, for the member and also the institution, too. I don't believe it's um, wise for us to close ourselves uh, off at all. Some of these are trips to the Middle East, uh, human rights, or we study about Russia or China. And um, today, we don't do that enough to understand what's going on in the rest of the world. And the added value, of course, is that we see each other in different kinds of ways when we travel together. And I think it's um, an important consideration as we look at this and however we come out on this, I think there is a general agreement that these are valuable ways uh, to learn about ourselves and our country and the rest of the world. And I believe they can be structured. I think it's, this is very good the way you've structured it here. If, if we want to do it another way to even tighten it further, that's fine too. But I think that um, we should look at this as, a, as not throwing out the baby with the bathwater. We understand the, the trips that are inappropriate. This, some of these trips are very, very appropriate, and I think we should look at them and, and really um, understand that these are necessary for our work, and I think that's what we ought to do. So thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Matsui. Mr. Gingry. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I actually don't have any questions for the witnesses. I do appreciate the amendment, and it's great to see uh, the bipartisanship. I mean, it, it, and I think you're right. I, I agree with almost everything Ms. Matsui uh, just said, uh, possibly with the exception of the expression uh, throwing the baby out with the bathwater, the implication, of course, being this amendment is the baby and the rest of the bill is bathwater. Uh, and I truly don't believe, as the chairman said, that, that this bill uh, is bathwater. I think that, as he, as he said and has said so many times, has made a strong, strong effort at bipartisanship uh, in regard to every section of this bill. Uh, and, uh, you know, with this amendment uh, and what Matt, Ms. Matsu was saying, and which Mr. Lundgren said as well, in regard to collegiality and the need for that, uh, it distresses me to, to hear uh, Mr. Miller's uh, response to uh, a direct question in regard to if we approve this amendment, uh, or do you think that you could consider uh, supporting the bill? And I think the answer was uh, no consideration of supporting the bill, despite the possible, uh, if this amendment was made in order and, and actually passed on the floor and became part of the bill. Uh, you know, we've made this effort at bipartisanship, and yet the other side uh, just digs in the hills and says, well, you know, uh, we'll, we'll, we're in favor of some uh, uh, sweetening amendments, but yet we're going to vote against the bill. And I, would, would, would I'm discouraged by that. Would the gentleman yield? I, I will, to my friend from Massachusetts. Yeah, no, and I, and I thank the gentleman for yielding to me. I mean, uh, for those of us who are opposed to, the, to this bill, there are a lot of reasons why, um, to be quite frank. Uh, it doesn't mean the bill can't be changed and, and amended and, and, uh, and fixed. Uh, uh, but I think one of the things that would that I think uh, to me would be a gesture of true bipartisanship uh, is that a lot of members here have um, specific proposals that they bring before the rules committee. You know why not open the process? I mean we we had a we had a testimony here from the experts that uh, that were assembled, and one of the things they talked about was one of the biggest problems currently plaguing the house uh, was the breakdown of the deliberative process uh, in this house. Um, and, um, and, you know, we, 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 we issued a minority report here, uh, Ranking Member Slaughter and, and all of us uh, sent uh, to the, uh, which I hope you had a chance to read, but one of the things we point out is that a legislative process that does not allow open debate and provide opportunity for amendment on legislation and instead allows small groups of House leaders and private interests to, to write bills is a process vulnerable to corruption and improper influence from lobbyists. And we heard that time and time again. And so I guess, 
you know, from our perspective, um, especially on a bill like this, when we're talking about cleaning the house up, we, this is not us talking, it, it was the experts that you brought before this committee, uh, Norm Ornstein among others, who said that, uh, you know, uh, one of the things that you're not addressing, one of the things that would help clean things up is opening up the process, being a more deliberative process, being more open, and I think a great gesture here um, that, quite frankly, if you let the 435 members of this House work its will on the House floor, allow us a substitute, um, you might find that this bill may be amended in a way that reflects where the majority in this House heads are really at. You might actually have a bill to pass it. It's not well, a question of, well, you know, it's one, this one amendment yeah. can change everything. I mean, you know, I, the gesture would be, you know, in true bipartisanship, here is that you know we're going to let everybody have a say. Well, we're reclaiming my time, and I and again, I mean, I, I I don't know how many of these amendments are going to be made in order. I mean, I don't make the final decision on that, as you know. Uh, but you know, and I hope some of them are. I mean, I, maybe this amendment will be one of those. But uh, uh, it's just discouraging to think that, despite the the effort at bipartisanship, that I think this uh, the majority on this committee and and, and our leader uh, has has uh, uh, really worked hard toward. Uh, and I'm sure some of these amendments will be made in, made in order, and yet uh, I'm discouraged to think that, that this will be boiled down to a totally partisan issue when we come to a final vote. Will the gentleman yield? Uh, I will, to the gentleman from California. I would just say I, I, I hope he's not characterizing my, my position as somehow I, I, I seek a partisan answer to this. Most of my victories in this House and, and on very large controversial bills have been bipartisan. Uh, but I, I would just say, you know, this is really about the rules of the place that we work, where we do the people's business. I tried to suggest that I thought our, our, we, should, we should simply have this under an open rule and let the members vote and design the place in which they work that they think best serves the public and, and, and have at it. But that's not going to be the process. And so there's going to be a lot, of, there are a lot of members on both sides of the aisle that are going to be shut out who have visions about how they think this place should work, things that they think are wrong with it, how it could, how it could better serve the, the, the public. Uh, and that's, that's not, that's not going to happen. This may be this bill more than any other bill we consider because it's really about the institution then which other legislation gets considered. But that's, that's not going to happen. But I'd certainly like it to happen. I'd be fully prepared. I'd, I'm sure I'd be joining with many Republicans on many amendments. Uh, uh, about this, uh, uh, about the operation of the uh, of the House, and I say that in a bipartisan in a bipartisan fashion because it's not like we had the franchise on running the perfect. But the fact of the matter is, the world has changed, has changed, and we're talking about the fundamental rules under the op the operation of this of this House. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Gentlemen. Chairman. Thank you. And I Thank you, you uh, Thank very you. much, Mr. Gingrich. Let me just respond to a couple of comments uh, that have been made here uh, in the last uh, couple of minutes uh, before I call on Mrs. Capito. Um, the fact is, if, if you look at the number of amendments that have been made in order under this Republican majority, we've made more Democratic amendments in order than Republican amendments. The bill that is being considered on the House floor um, at this moment had an equal number of Democratic amendments and equal number of Republican amendments. When we won the majority in 1994, we were particularly proud of the fact that we guaranteed a motion to recommit on every bill, something that was often denied us when I served here in the minority. And when it comes to the issue of this legislation itself, we have had a multi-month consideration, three original jurisdiction hearings held in this committee, and four other committees of jurisdiction, including the Judiciary Committee on which Mr. Lundgren sits, and uh, the Administration Committee, the Ethics Committee, uh, the Government Reform and Oversight Committee, all very involved in fashioning this legislation. We've had 73 amendments, and mark my words, we are going to have a number of amendments considered. Many amendments that have been offered are virtually identical and address the exact same issues. That's part of the role of the Rules Committee. And so I can assure you that as we proceed with this, we will have a free-flowing debate. We will consider a wide range of issues. As I said, virtually everyone seems to be unhappy with some aspect of this. As Mr. Gingrey just said, we have been working hard to reach out in a bipartisan way to address this issue. And I think that we are in a position where we could come up with a bipartisan solution. Mrs. Capito. May I, Mr. Chairman, before you... Mrs. Capito. Uh, <coughs> Thank you. I appreciate that very much. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I really want to say again that you're wrong on your statistics on amendments, and we will get that for you and put that in the record. 
But moreover, I think everybody in this city has beaten up on your bill. It's hollowed out, a snow job, several other things. I mean, frankly, I don't know uh, how what you're going to do to improve it, but let me talk about it. Those are the nicest things second. you can say about me, I know. Just about. Uh, the energy bill, the amendments were not allowed. If that, you'd allowed a few of those, and they could have been bipartisan, we would already have the windfall profits tax ready. We would also be able to help low-income people be able to pay for their gasoline to go to work. But no, we couldn't have those amendments because they didn't fit in with doing whatever the oil companies and the people who wrote that bill wanted. And so I, I appreciate your hard work, but I have to tell you, I can't let you keep saying that you've given all these amendments to us. Well, we're if we're going to have, if, if, if the gentlewoman would yield to me just for a moment to say that if we're going to have the energy debate, Thank I you. would take three particular issues and look at one that we tried to pursue very vigorously, and that is environmentally sound exploration in Anwar <laughs> using 21st century oh, technology. God, number one. Number two, <laughs> look. Please. Please. Uh, we have people who testified in here that they don't have my time here for a second. The governor the second, of Alaska the second, said he didn't know if the, there was any the, oil in there. Okay. On the second point, the issue of boutique fuels, which I think is another very, the complexity of boutique, boutique fuels, which has a played, played a role in exacerbating the prices and lack of refinery capacity. We are very committed to ensuring that we actually reduce the cost of fuel for the American consumer. That's what we're determined to do, and I think we have a chance to do that. So now that we've debated energy in the midst Thank of this you, issue Capito. on travel, I am happy to recognize Mrs. Capito. Well, after that, uh, I would uh, really just like to say that um, I think this is an important topic that we're dealing with today. And I think that uh, hopefully at the end of the day, we're going to regain whatever trust we may have lost with the American people in terms of lobbying behavior and behavior with uh, members of Congress. But I think we always have been, we've been drawing a distinction that if people are going to break the law, are going to cheat, steal, and lie, no matter what we do here or in this piece of legislation, those people are still going to be able to do that. I mean, I think we've found that, un, uh, you know, discouragingly so. So I would like to thank the chairman for his efforts in this. Uh, I, I share his frustration in that um, everything has become so politicized that when we are talking about an institution that we care about and, and the, the rules that we will live by and our future generations are going to live by, we can't. We always seem to get sidetracked into uh, finger pointing and he said, she said. So I would like to see us move forward on this process. I'm sorry I missed the debate mostly on your amendments, but that's my um, Brilliant. comment for the, <laughs> that's my comment for the time being. Thank you. <laughs> Gentlemen, thank you both very much for being here. We uh, appreciate you, your, uh, your hard and work. If, if this amendment is adopted, I am far more likely to support the bill. Thank you very much for that. Um, <clears throat> we're very pleased to have the distinguished ranking minority member of the uh, Committee on the Judiciary here, Mr. Conyers. Please come forward. Without objection, any uh, prepared statement that you have will appear in the record in its entirety, and we welcome your summary. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the Distinguished Rules Committee. I come here on a very narrow purpose here because I seek the openness of the rule that you are considering in this matter of the lobbying accountability law. Um, what we want this committee to do is to adopt an open rule in the matter. And given the nature and climate of the recent scandals, <coughs> uh, the need for a fair and open debate on this issue is vital. It's become increasingly clear that as legislators, we have a job to do in any debate on open government must not restrict the discussion of serious proposals. And so my only plea today is to make the Democratic proposal H.R. 4682 in order so that it will provide a real step toward effective reform and uh, give us a chance to vote on some kind of alternative. Uh, I, con I conclude by pointing out that 
that the Democratic proposal sets new contribution and fundraising limits on lobbyists and lobbying firms, fundamentally changes the gift, travel, and employment relationship among members of Congress, lobbyists, and lobbying firms, and requires disclosure of grassroots and coalition lobbyists. And I, I regret that the one amendment that came out of Judiciary Committee as part of the jurisdiction uh, which required lobbyists to disclose uh, solicitations of, of uh, campaign contributions in addition to their own contributions was removed from the, the, uh, uh, our part of the, of the jurisdiction. And I <coughs> lament that on behalf of most of the members of the Judiciary Committee. But I, I urge that we have a chance to to vote on the alternative proposal, if that is possible. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Conyers. I appreciate it. Any questions, Mr. Putnam? Uh, Mrs. Uh, Slaughter? I absolutely agree with you. Let me, was it, the bill you're speaking of, is that the one that required lobbyists to report on their contacts with members of the House and, and their staff? Um, uh, and, and, and any fundraising efforts. That's, 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 it's that's, not just enough for them to report what they have contributed themselves. But any collections of uh, monies for members also be uh, reported. And the reason given for taking that out was that it was against we, the First we, Amendment? Or something. We never get uh, uh, reasons from the Rules Committee why things are taken out. I seem to have heard somewhere that it had to do with First Amendment and uh, the chilling of lobbying, something like oh. that. Oh! <laughs> I, I, I remember something about that as well. Were other amendments that, that passed the Judiciary Committee taken out? Uh, yeah, we, we, we passed, a, we had a number of other amendments, uh, uh, Democratic amendments that were uh, passed or accepted uh, in the Judiciary Committee. All right, thank you, Mr. Conn. You're Mrs. Capito. Mr. McGovern. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I, I want to thank Mr. Kanyas for his testimony, and I certainly support his um, desire to make uh, that bill in order, and, um, and I also uh, appreciate his call for an open rule. Um, to the extent that there are uh, members that are offering basically the same amendments or similar amendments, I'm sure that we could, uh, if we wanted to, uh, work with them to get them to join together and offer one amendment so that we're not having three people offer the same amendment. But I just want, I want to read something here because it goes back to the point I made before, which I think is, 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 is vital to this debate, yet is, is missing in this debate. Uh, because there are some uh, um, in this House who, uh, who choose to ignore the connection between uh, the corruption and the lack of uh, procedural fairness uh, that is going on here. Uh, I mentioned that uh, among the many people that testified before the committee was uh, the longtime congressional scholar, Dr. Norman Ornstein of the American Enterprise Institute. And he was sitting right where you are, Mr. Kanye. He said uh, to this committee, the problem uh, goes beyond corrupt lobbyists or the relationship between lobbyists and lawmakers. It gets to a legislative process that has lost the, tr the, the, has lost the transparency, accountability, and deliberation that are at the core of the American system. The failure to abide by basic rules and norms has contributed, I believe, to a loss of sensitivity among many members and leaders about what is and what is not appropriate. Three-hour votes, 1,000-page bills uh, sprung on the floor with no notice, conference reports changed in the dead of night, self-executing rules that suppress debate along with an explosion of closed rules are just a few of the practices that have become common and that are a distortion of the regular order. You know, a lot of the most egregious items that get a lot of press tend to be snuck into bills uh, when nobody's looking. Um, and in late night sessions and in conference committees where they, they technically don't even meet. Um, you know, if we could get the procedural rules right, if we could actually follow the rules of this institution, I think we deal with a lot of these other problems. And just, you know, one, one final uh, thing, and that is that uh, I think it is important uh, that, uh, uh, that given the fact that what we're talking about here is the rules that govern ourselves, it shouldn't be up to a few members on the Rules Committee or a few members in the Speaker's office or the Majority Leader's office to decide what is okay to offer and what is not okay to offer. I mean, we're all going to have to live with this stuff. 
And just because you're not, you know, you're not on the rules committee or you're not a member of the leadership doesn't mean that you don't have a contribution to make. And so this should be an open process. If any bill that we have before us should be open, this should be it. Uh, and so I want to thank you for coming before the committee. I support your request. And I also appreciate you uh, coming up and uh, asking for openness and an open rule. Thank well, you. Mr. Yes. McGovern, uh, the test of, of how effective this lobbying proposal will be will be determined by the rules governing how it will operate, how we will proceed on the floor. Right. I mean, if you, if you get a lobbying bill with uh, literally closed rules, uh, a closed rule, uh, that speaks for itself. And I, I'm... Uh, Gentlemen, let me just say we will not have a closed rule on this. I feel very certain that we won't. Okay, I, I'm I'm feeling a little better already. Don't don't good. feel too much better though. All right. We don't want you to feel too good. Uh, you, look, opti you optimism is a requirement for me to even continue to work in the Congress after 40 years, and I I uh, and that's why I'm up here today because I, I believe we still have to continue to press. Uh, for the openness that you uh, assure me that will happen, but well, I thank you. I want and I want to thank the gentleman for his uh, for his statement. I just say one final thing, and that is that um, it, it's it's not just enough to have good rules; you got to follow the rules. I mean, we have rules in this house, for example, that you're supposed to have a certain amount of time before a bill comes to the floor to read the bill. Uh, not doesn't seem to me to be a terribly controversial rule, but um, routinely this committee waives that rule. Um, and important pieces of legislation, and in fact, the more important the pieces of legislation, the more likely that you're that we that we that we that the, those rules are waived. So it's not just getting a good set of rules on the books; it's making sure that we follow those rules. And so again, I, I, I think that uh, to the extent that this could be as open a process as possible uh, on the House floor, I think it would reflect well um, on this on this institution. So I thank the gentleman, Mr. Cole. Mrs. Matsui, Mr. Bishop, <coughs> Mr. Gingrey, great. Thank you very much, Mr. Conyers. Appreciate your being here. Uh, our next witness is the uh, gentleman from Iowa, Mr. King. And why don't we, uh, uh, Mr. Wicker, and uh, why don't we bring Mr. Gomert up too as we uh, proceed to uh, move down our uh, list here. So, Mr. King, please uh, feel free to uh, enter any prepared <coughs> statement that you. Uh, have in the record without objection it'll be included as a will for all of you uh, gentlemen and we welcome your summary thank you uh, mr chairman and i uh, will say that energy is germane when it comes to travel it all takes energy That's right. and uh, but what i what i've done is I, i've looked at this situation that deals with uh, private travel and i and i agree with a lot of the discussion that i've heard around the rules committee here <coughs> that it that we should not ban private travel, but we should have sunlight on that private travel. And so what I do with my amendment is not uh, not go in and just address 501c3s, but just go broader to any private travel that's all right today is all right tomorrow or after this amendment might pass, with the exception of it goes before the Rules Committee for pre-approval. And uh, I hope it's the Ethics Committee and not the Rules me. Committee. Yes. Uh, we don't want to deal with that here, I assure you. <laughs> Thank you for that correction. I'm glad to know the chairman's listening. It's, um, it goes before the Ethics Committee for pre-approval of the, the cost, the entity that's paying for the trip, purpose of the trip, modes of transportation, accommodations, meals, et cetera. And then upon return, uh, five days upon the return, then file a report. Um, it is a simple thing that puts sunlight on it. It also picks up some of the philosophy of the Chairman of the Rules Committee in that it be filed in a searchable and sortable database so that the bloggers can track what's going on in, in Congress. And I, I move the, uh, the date up to uh, August 15th rather than December 15th because I think we can move more quickly. And I would like to yield to my colleague, Mr. Wicker, for his remarks yeah, with regard you. to this amendment. Well, I thank my colleague from Iowa, and I thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, Mrs. Ranking Member. Uh, it, it is my goal in, in this effort to uh, have a, an ethics bill that still allows the Aspen trips, the Heritage Foundation uh, seminars, uh, the, the APAC trips uh, to the, the Holy Land and, and um, organizations such as that. I do think Mr. King's amendment addresses the question that Mr. Hastings from Washington asked with regard to 501c3s. Uh, he doesn't talk about the, the tax status of the organization, but, but merely the, uh, the transparency 
and, and getting the, the prior approval. Uh, I don't know if a lot of the public understands the nature of these trips, and, and that's what I want to convey in the brief time that I have here. Uh, I, I have uh, the, the uh, stack of reading material that uh, we had to digest when we went to the uh, Heritage Foundation uh, uh, retreat in, in January of this year in Baltimore, Maryland. I would just show this to the members of We're not going to enter it in the record. The I'll, I'll not ask that it be included in the record. Uh, as far as the Aspen trips, I want the public to understand this. This is a booklet of scholarly uh, materials that must be read by every congressional participant in the Aspen programs. And if they don't do the reading, and if they don't attend every meeting, and if they don't participate in the discussion, the members are not invited back. This is a serious policy discussion. Now, I have one here, political Islam, challenges for U.S. policy. It was in uh, uh, the end of May and the 1st of June, 2005. The sponsors were the Ford Foundation, the MacArthur Foundation, the Carnegie Corporation of New York, and the Rockefeller Brothers Fund. No agenda there except, as the previous uh, witnesses have said, to, to develop and, and discuss uh, a very important issue and to engage in collegiality and discussion among members of both parties. This one here is on US, Russia, Europe. Again, uh, sponsored by the Carnegie Corporation and the Ford Foundation. Uh, there is no abuse in uh, uh, members of the House and Senate get, getting together, sponsored by these organizations, and talking about these issues. And then U.S.-China relations, the third one I have, again, sponsored by the Ford Foundation and the Asia Foundation. How could the public, how could anyone object to this? If you go to these meetings, Mr. Chairman, uh, the, the, after a breakfast, the meetings begin at 9 a.m. Uh, the discussions continue till around 1.15. You get about three hours off in the afternoon, and then the dinner is a requirement and you must sit with your assigned, uh, uh, the, with the other assigned uh, participants and participate in discussion. This is, this is an important educational tool for members of Congress. It is not an abuse. It doesn't need to be included in this legislation, which is designed to address abuses. And, and I agree, I believe, with what uh, Mr. Miller said. Uh, if this amendment, or one like his, is made in order, it will pass. I think it will pass on an overwhelming bipartisan basis. And so I would hope that we could take this issue off the table, make it clear that these types of scholarly conferences are, do, not consider, uh, do not constitute abuses, and, uh, and then go on with the, with the more serious uh, abuses that, that we'd all like to address. Thank you very much, Mr. Wicker. Mr. Gomer. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll move the microphone over the there. Amendment. Just move the microphone over for me. The amendment that uh, I'm proposing would ask to be ruled in order uh, would strike the criminal criminal penalty provisions of Section 106 and replace them with strongly enhanced civil penalties. Uh, I would follow up on the comments of Mr. Lundgren and Ms. Matsui as she followed up on his comments. I mean, this should not be a gotcha place to work, and this is what this legislation with criminal penalties begins to make it. Uh, this is uh, applying to lobbyists, and it's true, I think the best disinfectant is good sunlight, but to allow any violation to be a crime when so many people will rely on their accountant, they provide them, they sign them, they send them, a violation, uh, uh, any provision in this bill, and you're looking at three years in prison, and if members of Congress don't think that that will flip back on them, I'm telling you, as a, as a former district judge and chief justice, I'd put our criminal justice system up against any in the world. I think we have the best. But it is easy to abuse by the wrong people, and it could, in a bipartisan way, depending on who's wanting to abuse it, be abused here. Some poor lobbyists, and we have them all from our states that come up here time to time. They're paid lobbyists. They sign the accountants records indicating uh, what's 
transpired according to what the law would be if this passes and it turns out they missed something, it's, it's a crime. Now, the fact that the, the bill says, well, it'd have to be will, willful and knowingly, folks, all they'd have to do is show, seen it done time and again. Well, you know, you're smart people. I, I, I've sat in with FBI uh, interrogation. Well, you're a smart guy. You think you're going to sell that to the jury? They know you're educated and, and you missed filing this or missed up on this. Now, of course, what we can do, uh, you gave this contribution to this Congress member or that. Uh, any chance they ever, you ever ask anything? I mean, this is an open end to make witch hunts and it could affect the Democrats, it could affect the Republicans, and I am not for criminalizing innocent conduct. You know, there was a old bumper sticker about uh, gun control that when you outlaw guns, only outlaws have guns. We keep criminalizing conduct that may be innocent around this facility, and it's gonna only be the criminals that can afford to be up here. The innocent people that make innocent mistakes that aren't good at being criminals, they're not going to be able to afford to be here. I'm adamantly opposed to criminalizing conduct that may be innocent. Uh, we have criminal laws, and that's why Duke Cunningham will probably be going to prison, Jack Abramoff. You know, if, if Mr. Mollahan has done something wrong, that there are laws that, are, that apply. We don't need to keep criminalizing our conduct and putting uh, people in jeopardy that shouldn't be. Thank you, Mr. Well, thank you, uh, gentlemen, very much, and uh, appreciate your, your thoughtful testimony. And let me just say that uh, Mr. Wicker brought out all those uh, documents. I was reminded that I had David Obey's uh, Aspen Institute package from two and a half decades ago sitting here for one of our original jurisdiction hearings, so we certainly have heard from a wide range of members on that and, uh, and appreciate it. I have no questions. Mr. Putnam. Mrs. Slaughter. No questions, thank you. Mrs. Capito. Mr. McGovern. No, I, I think they're both good amendments, and I, I hope that, uh, the, uh, you know, I, Mr. Gomer, I, I'm concerned, like you are, too, that, you know, in the, in the, in the uh, desire to kind of get this right, that you can cross a line that, you know, may be kind of productive, and I certainly think we need to be very careful about that, and I hope that you have an opportunity to debate your amendment on the floor, and I, I think, you know, on the travel amendments, I think what you proposed here is something absolutely that we should discuss on the floor. I guess I, I, the, the one issue with regard to travel, though, that uh, that no one seems to have addressed uh, thus far in, in the form of an amendment is this whole issue of uh, corporate jets. Um, Mrs. Slaughter, in the, in the past, has, has raised this issue uh, quite a bit. But under the current bill right now, um, you can uh, take a corporate jet. Remember, Congress, Congress could take a corporate jet from Washington to wherever, um, uh, as long as a lobbyist is not on the plane, and pay a first-class fare. Uh, and that's perfectly okay. Um, you know, people in the real world can't do that. Uh, they have to pay for the entire charter. And I guess, um, does your amendment in any way address that issue of, uh, of, of travel by corporate jets? And um, do you have any opinion on that as to, um, it just seems to me to be, uh, you know, something that uh, is kind of a no-brainer that we should fix, but yet it's just there. Well, of course, this is Mr. King's amendment, not mine, uh, and I support Mr. King's amendments. Uh, but no, it doesn't deal with corporate jets, and I would simply defer to the chairman to uh, elucidate the members as to what. Well, uh, if, uh, if the gentleman would yield, I'm, yield I'm happy to, to state committee. that the issue of corporate jets is addressed by the Federal Election Commission, which we sanction. These regulations are promulgated by the Federal Election Commission, and we stand by those. If the Federal Election Commission were to make a decision to modify that, the requirement is that first class airfare plus one dollar is paid by any member who flies on a corporate aircraft. The only change that we make in the law is that we require, as the gentleman said, that a lobbyist not be present on board the aircraft uh, when it is utilized. Yeah. Well, 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 I thank my friend. For no, and I, and I appreciate the chairman's comment, but it just seems like kind of a cop out, to be honest with you, because the, for example, to fly from here to California on a, a first class fare plus one dollar is like two thousand uh, bucks. To uh, to uh, charter a corporate jet, I don't care what the uh, federal election committee says, that's thirty thousand dollars. I mean, you know, I think, uh, you know, uh, you know, I think a lot of people are scratching their heads saying, why can't you know? Why do you get to do that? We can. I mean, you know, and, and we can change the rules here. Uh, so, you know, the, the issue that the, you know, the Federal Election Commission, you know, made this rule um, is kind of irrelevant. I mean, we're here about, you know, promoting more accountability and, uh, you know, about, 
but at, least, at, a, at a minimum, trying to give the public uh, the impression that, in fact, we're cleaning up our act and we get it. And it just seems to me that if we don't address that issue, um, you know, uh, you know that, that's, that's kind of a glaring, uh, you know, uh, example of uh, kind of an excessive perk that, uh, that uh, real people don't have. And anyway, uh, but I appreciate your amendment. I, again, I support both uh, amendments being made on the House floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, uh, I want to start out with Mr. Goldman. I particularly appreciate what you're trying to do. I think you're bringing a, ju a judge's good sense to, uh, uh, to this process. And uh, there, there's a great deal of merit in what you're suggesting about uh, quickly uh, criminalizing acts that, that quite often are innocent and, and clearly uh, are not taken with the intent to hurt people. So I, I think there's a great deal of merit in that. Uh, Mr. King, I like your amendment, honestly, because uh, it does two things. One, it allows for a lot more flexibility, even in the First Amendment that we heard. It could deal with these concerns about privately funded and appropriate, but not 501c3 uh, travel, uh, and I like that. And uh, frankly, it puts responsibility straight on the Ethics Committee, where it ought to be. And uh, I don't know if this is really included in your amendment, so I'd like you to respond to this, but I, I'm a big believer as a member on that committee that if you're going to have a peer review committee, that the members themselves, you shouldn't get a little letter from the ethics committee saying this is okay at the staff level. But if it's going to be private travel and if it's going to be a concern, that there probably ought to be a vote or there ought to be a discussion. There ought to be an approval process where the members on that committee basically have to say yay or nay and are sort of accountable for what they've, they've permitted. Would that uh, be the case under your amendment? Uh, Mr. Paul, I, I don't address that under my amendment, but uh, it's contemplated that uh, if this does pass, that there will be rules written around how to deal with uh, pre-approval. And certainly the issues that you've raised, I would think, would fit within the scope of those kind of requirements. And I'd like to think that the Ethics Committee could step forward and volunteer to, to uh, take on that mantle as well. Well, I, I would hope so. I may be, uh, because there, there are legitimate logistical questions here. Of how often do you meet and how much? How, I don't know. I don't have a... A, a clear feel for the volume of private travel and so the, and the timeliness of the decisions that would need to be made. And that's what, but I think that that's something worth talking about. Uh, I again, I'm not sure what will happen uh, with this amendment or ultimately with the bill. But if we end up uh, in a situation where the ethics committee is uh, uh, required to report back, I would urge you to stay engaged in this process because I think you have a suggestion that, that's a very good one and again allows for the flexibility to make make decisions and but for but points where the responsibility for that is that too and it would have to be a bipartisan uh, responsibility. I'd actually had uh, a proposal that we floated that would have required a two-thirds approval supermajority at the ethics committee for any private travel. So you would have a, not just bipartisan, by, by definition you're going to have a bipartisan vote on the Ethics Committee or nothing happens, but you would have to have substantial bipartisanship uh, to, uh, to be able to go on a private travel, and yet you would still have uh, the flexibility to say, well, this isn't the 501c3, but it's clearly appropriate. Nobody goes to an oil rig in the Gulf of Mexico for a vacation. That <laughs> seems to make sense to us. Uh, you know, I noticed when I, I travel, nobody... Uh, in, uh, in my district ever questions it if I go to Afghanistan or Iraq or someplace, whether it's on public travel or on private travel. The, the, the destination defines in those cases. And in the cases where I don't travel, uh, though I go to someplace that's really nice. And Mr. Wicker mentioned, uh, you know, the uh, political Islam trip. I, I didn't take that one. I think I took the one that went to uh, Istanbul. I think that one was Barcelona, if I remember. Uh, that's pretty serious stuff. You're with some of the very best scholars in the world. And I know Mr. Wicker and I have been on a couple of these things together, and they really are just simply superb. Um, and you come, I learned more about China policy in a week uh, at one of these sessions than I would learn, uh, frankly, in a committee meeting, particularly since I don't deal with that on international relations, but I've got to vote on it, uh, than I would have learned uh, in years of Congress. So th these kinds of concentrated, uh, you know, study trips that really expose you to the very best scholars in the world are incredibly uh, valuable. And again, uh, the point that Mr. Miller made about the human relationships that get formed there are, is absolutely correct. I mean, uh, philosophically, Mr. Miller and I are, 
are rather distant, but I think we like one another, and uh, we certainly have had uh, had great exchanges at Aspen Institute meetings. I uh, think somebody I think highly of his uh, integrity is beyond question, and uh, you know that knowing that you know makes it possible someplace else to have to negotiate in good faith over something else, and uh, I think people need to understand that. So I commend you all for your efforts. I just think they're first rate, and I particularly. Mr. Wicker, appreciate you bringing the reading material so people can visually see what we're talking about and, uh, and begin to understand that we're talking uh, about very serious activity that has a very beneficial person. Thank you very much, Mr. Cole. Mrs. Matsui. Okay. Mr. Bishop. Yes, thank you. Uh, I appreciate it. Actually, first for Mr. Cole. So, when I was when I was in state legislature and went to an NCSL trip to Tulsa, was that an obviously good trip or a? Never mind. Forget that. <laughs> Clearly, a vacation venue. Actually, I do have Mr. King. I have a specific question on your amendment. The cost of the trip would be posted after five days, but on page two, in the first couple of lines, it talks about the trip itself, the travel, would be posted on the internet. There's no timeline of that. What was your intentions of when the trip itself would be posted? I, I envisioned that you would pull, you would file your report to the ethics committee, uh, that the summary of the trip with the details that I had laid out, and then uh, that that would be posted immediately on the internet as soon as as soon as practical on the internet. Prior to the trip. After the trip. It was post. It would be post post trip. Yes. Is the intent of and I think this is what uh, Mr. Cole brought up was the intent of going to the Ethics Committee for these trips to allow them to adjudicate whether a trip was worthwhile or not? To, um, that might be one way to phrase that. I'd say that I, I envision a little bit differently and to adjudicate whether that trip is legitimate and ethical within the guidelines that we have for travel. And worthwhile would be one of those important measures. If they're not specifically going to pre-approve that trip, why not just uh, do the like concept and have all trips posted on the internet and let uh, somebody else make that decision? Well, like, I think like the, the members voters. want to have that sense of certainty that there's been that stamp of approval, um, so that they can go with a with a clear conscience and and realize that that they have they have that they know that they have functioned within the rules. That's that's why I look to the ethics committee for that approval rather than say post it on the internet and allow the bloggers to be the ones that pass judgment. And another point would be uh, to pre-file trips um, um, before you go, say if you said five days before you left, and to that for that to be available on the internet, then you'd have the public scrutinizing before you left. And I think that could open up a can of worms. Some people will, they will pull out of a trip before they go. I don't think it's certain until you're back that you've actually traveled. So I'd rather uh, look at the ethics committee for pre-approval and then uh, five days afterwards post the facts of the trip, the costs and the, and the reimbursement, and then post it on the internet as soon as practical and have the staff do that. Thank you. There, there may also be, if you were to pre-post the trip, security concerns on oh, yes. kind of trip. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Gingrich? Madam, thank you, thank you, Madam Chair. Just a quick uh, question again for Mr. King, uh, Amendment Number 30. Uh, the, the last part of the amendment, uh, changing uh, the date of the Standards Committee report from December the 15th uh, back to August the 15th, uh, best case scenario, hopefully we'll pass our version uh, on Thursday, tomorrow, and of course uh, the Senate has already done that. Uh, and we'll go to conference and maybe have a have a bill that we can vote on and pass uh, by Memorial Day. Uh, that doesn't give a lot of time for the uh, Committee on Standards uh, uh, to to give us a report, a very thoughtful report. What is your thinking in regard to wanting to, to do that? Question? Well, the thinking was that that uh, to wait till December is a long time to be hanging in limbo, and the intent was to try to move it up and accelerate. And I, you know, I don't envision that it's that difficult to get organized uh, to do pre-approval. I think those those guidelines are pretty clear. So I would think that it would just be a matter of a few weeks in order for the for the ethics committee to get to get established and to be able to set themselves up for pre-approval. I think if we wait till December, there will be a lot of trips that will go by the wayside. And that was the intent was to try to get this system up and get it functioning as soon as possible. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Madam Chair. No, no other questions. Thank you, Mr. King. All right. No further questions. I want to thank the panel. And, uh, I have another yes. Amendment. Oh, you have another amendment? Yes, sir. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, the, um, the second amendment 
is, um, is an amendment that deals with financial disclosure and reporting. And I will say that you know, when, I, when I first came to this Congress and filled out my financial disclosure statement, and um, what, I, what I do is um, I have a CPA review financial statement that all of my assets and liabilities are on. And uh, then I go to that, and then I have to post into these categories, these ranges. And it got kind of tricky to pick out the ranges and put the X's in the boxes. But I realized when I filled out the first one that there was a lot of latitude for error. And uh, as I watched this over the years, it, as we came into this, uh, the issue of um, campaign financial reporting and contributions, I drafted this legislation. I actually asked for the draft last January. It came back, and I filed it in a separate bill on March 15th. But this is, a, this is a segment of that that requires specific dollar amounts to be reported on our financial disclosure statements as opposed to ranges. And the ranges that we have, um, I brought the piece here, but you've all looked at these and filled these out. But if you go back into, the, into this, there are ranges that might be uh, from, you see, five, or 15,000 to 50,000. There are ranges that are from, once you get up to 5 million, you can go from 5 million to an unlimited amount. And their range in there is so great and the categories that are offered in there that if you're reporting in on the low side, you can end up with a huge distortion. If you're reporting on the high side, you can end up with a huge distortion. And uh, twice since I've sat in this room, the issue of the former ranking member of the Ethics Committee and the issues that are going on there has been raised. And I, and I will submit that, it, that there's potentially uh, one could deduce from those statements that he's filed that perhaps he had a net worth five years ago of $100,000, and today it's not possible to determine if that net worth is $6 million or $25 million, given the ranges that are offered here. And I think it's essential. If we're going to have integrity in this system, if we're going to have the public have confidence in us, if we're required to do financial reporting, and we are, that we report the real dollars there and do so in a searchable, sortable, downloadable database so that the bloggers out there in the, in the world can track this. And I would submit that rather than a five-year issue going on with a former ranking member of ethics, that's something that might have been addressed one or two or three years ago if there had been specific dollar amounts rather than let this thing go to the point where it has and apparently <coughs> gone. So I'm, I'm trying to address uh, those kind of circumstances with this, and I believe as, uh, as uh, the public scrutinizes the issues that are unfolding that I've alluded to just previously, we'll be really glad if we have an opportunity to vote for specific dollar amounts because the earmarks are only part of the problem. The ranges for financial reporting are a much broader license, and I think we need to take that license away and that latitude away and just be straight up honest. It's easier anyway, and the public will then know where we stand with our finances. I want to thank you. Uh, I certainly believe the document you're referring to is extremely important, and any ways to improve it, I think, uh, should be uh, looked at in great detail. Uh, Mr. Cole? Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, I, as you know, Mr. King, we talked about this before. I have a great deal of sympathy, honestly, with what you're trying to do. Uh, my, my guess is a lot of members will, will suggest that uh, this is too explicit uh, and too detailed a revelation of their private financial holdings. How would you respond to that? We live in a fishbowl, and um, everything I have and everything I do is scrutinized. It's, I think it's more difficult to face the assumptions that can come from the latitude of having broad ranges to report than it would be simply to put down the dollars and cents. Uh, from an accounting perspective, it's far easier. Some of the members actually do put down the specific amounts. And uh, I think that when the, when the public looks at how much latitude has been there and what kind of things might have evolved that are being investigated now from that latitude, I think we'll be very glad if we can have specific amounts. And I know there'll be members that will say, well, how do I establish the amount of real estate? That's a flexible thing. And, uh, and, and I just simply say, all the cash you have, the stock values, they're all easy. Those are dollars and cents things. With real estate, there's appraisal, there's assessed value. Uh, and so it's easy to put a number down. And you'll be able to stand on that number if you pick a consistent source and use that source. Uh, you know, again, I agree with you very much. Uh, Congressman Sensenbrenner does that. Uh, he just literally every thing he has. I know there are another number of other members, and I have to tell you, I'm getting ready this weekend to spend my entire weekend looking at that thing uh, and filling it out. And uh, you know, I'm certainly uh, willing to do that. Uh, but I, it's just much easier if you're not looking at ranges. If you just okay, this is the value of this asset, this asset, that asset. Uh, I don't. Most members, I don't think really. As I read those things, and I've seen a lot of them over the years, um, 
you can generally tell at the end of one, no matter what the range it is, is somebody, you know, what they're, are they very rich, are they somewhat rich, are they middle income, are they poor and living off their salary? Uh, so having the, the detail there has a great deal of merit. It would be a lot easier, and I'm, I am positive there, there are ways to devise forms that are easier than that form to fill out. I think whoever designs this is probably in training to, to move next to the IRS uh, to uh, work on forms there. Uh, so I, I appreciate your effort to simplify our lives. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Slaughter. Mr. Bishop. Steve, I, don't want, I would only say on the asset side, the zero to 100,000 level makes me look a whole lot richer than I really am. So. <laughs> I would just, I just want to say in, in response to what Mr. Cole said about some members maybe thinking that uh, this is too explicit, um, I think the way to test that is to have a vote on it, have a debate and a vote, like all these things. I mean, these are the rules that are going to govern us. That's why, you know, I'm going to continue to advocate for as open a process as humanly possible here. Uh, the idea that we're going to pick and choose what members are going to be able to vote on and, and not vote on, uh, you know, with regard to the rules that govern us, uh, I, I think is just a mistake. Uh, you know, I'll go back to what I said at the very beginning here. I mean, part of the problem that we have here and part of the, uh, part of the uh, issues that most Americans are concerned about um, and that have led to a lot of the abuses has been the closed nature of the way we do business here, the lack of deliberation. And, you know, if, if people want stricter requirements, uh, reporting requirements, then we should have that debate. We should vote up or down on that, uh, on that uh, amendment. So I, uh, you know, I certainly support you uh, having the ability to bring this to the floor, and I hope it's made in order. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Gingrey. Madam Chair, thank you. I, uh, and, and Representative King, I, I think this is a, a real good amendment, and I, you know, I think you're a non-attorney member of the Judiciary Committee, and, and I see so many of the good amendments you bring forward. I'm sure that the chairman there appreciates your good work. Uh, this is another one of those things that, you know, all of a sudden uh, you realize that there's just sort of a, of a loophole out there that unintended, I'm sure. Uh, I've got an amendment later on that we'll discuss that addresses another uh, that was brought to light during our hearings on this uh, bill. We had probably 16 hours of hearings, I think four different sessions. Uh, but I agree completely with you. And, and while it may really not make our lives simpler, uh, particularly in regard to filling out the form, uh, if, a, if someone uh, hasn't had their real property uh, appraised in five or six or eight or ten years, maybe they darn well should, uh, and that's just good business uh, sense. Uh, and, and to have this, this range situation, you're absolutely right. Uh, nobody, I don't think, is going to fudge on the high side. Uh, and and if, if, the, if the purpose of, of filing these kind of uh, financial disclosures reports serve a useful purpose, and I truly believe that they do, then uh, to have them more accurately reflect the, uh, the net worth of an individual member, I think, is, uh, is pretty significant, particularly when, as you pointed out, in regard to uh, the, the next cycle. Uh, when it's done, or, or, or the next cycle after that, where you see in some instances, I mean, we can take all examples off the board, but you, you, you know, it, the rate, it would raise a red flag, but only if the information on both reports was accurate. So I thank you for the amendment. I, I, I hope it's made in order. I, I thank you, and if I might add that um, it will provide a specific um, path so that ill-gotten gains, uh, if there are any, will be revealed far sooner. Ms. Matsui? No question. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. We'll call the next uh, panel up in the, on the Committee on the Judiciary. We'll have Mrs. Waters and uh, Ms. Jackson Lee, please. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair and members. Uh, I have two amendments that I've come today to offer, uh, but it opens up the opportunity for me to uh, say to you I was rather disappointed. Uh, that the bill that was voted out of committee was changed so drastically. Uh, I supported that bill, despite the fact many of my colleagues on my side of the aisle did not support the bill. It was my feeling at the time that we needed to get started with reform, and where, even though we may differ 
uh, about uh, the extent of the reforms uh, that unless we pass something uh, and try to have a bipartisan effort on something, we, we would probably uh, not get very far. Having said that, um, in committee, uh, I was pleased that the uh, substitute that we offered included language that would have uh, made members disclose their contact uh, with members of Congress. Who did you talk to? When did you talk to them? And what were you lobbying? And that would be clear in the disclosure. Uh, I thought that was uh, adopted, and I added to that uh, that we should include uh, the employees, those persons on our staffs who talk with lobbyists, so that it would be clear that lobbyists may have talked to a member, may have talked to a staff member, uh, but uh, we would know that there had been a contact and basically uh, what the subject matter was. Now, this bill uh, comes out, uh, and as it is uh, drafted today, none of that's in the bill. And there are several other measures that were in the bill uh, that do not appear to be present. I don't know how that happens. I honestly do not know what happens once a bill leaves committee, it's been voted upon, it's been agreed upon how uh, then it is altered uh, in some way that does not reflect the actual work that took place. And I would say to the Rules Committee, if you find this is true, you have no choice but to have an open rule so that those persons who uh, supported the bill because it had certain things in it um, would have an opportunity to offer those amendments on the floor. Having said that, I offer my amendment, the first one, that would include that all legislative branch employees, particularly all employees of congressional members, um, uh, be required to report uh, the lobbyist contacts. That's number one. Number two, um, the third amendment that I, uh, uh, Title uh, Waters 093, Title Three, III, Section 301 of the legislation, calls for an indefinite suspension of gifts of travel as defined under Clause 5 of House Rules 25. Now, I disagree with that one, and I would like to offer this amendment uh, and explain to you why. Many of us uh, travel. We do not take golf trips. We do not take pleasure trips. We do not take trips that are offered uh, by special interest groups, particularly in the corporate community. Um, uh, we do take trips because we speak to church organizations, uh, educational institutions, civil rights organizations, and women's groups. These are all nonprofits. Uh, uh, well, they're all uh, nonprofits for the most part. Uh, some of them have lobbyists. Some of the larger educational institutions certainly have lobbyists. But it's normally not the lobbyists who contact us. It is the student's union. It is the uh, women's center. It is the political science department. And so we believe that that's an important part of our work. Uh, many of these communities that we go to are pretty isolated communities. And they don't get to interact uh, very much with their own member of Congress. Uh, let alone members of Congress who represent uh, various um, committees of Congress where they're discussing issues that they're concerned about. So I, I think it's extremely important that we have the opportunity uh, to go to these speaking engagements, uh, to go to these conferences, and to interact uh, particularly with the young people in our educational institutions and these church groups, uh, many of whom have issues, many issues, and increasingly with the faith-based initiative type discussions that are going on here. They want to talk about what's going on, how to access the process, and on and on and on. I do not think we should be precluded from having those kinds of contacts with citizens across this country. And my amendment uh, would attempt to put that back in uh, by identifying educational institutions, churches, nonprofit organizations, low and moderate income housing, health and civil rights organizations. And I think that covers the uh, majority of them. Uh, with that, I would yield back the balance of my time. Uh, yeah. Uh, I only have these two. Yes.
thank, uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair, uh, and thank uh, the Rules Committee for a tough job. Uh, many times we come here about uh, legislation that governs others. <laughs> We're now here to talk about legislation that governs us. As a member of the House Judiciary Committee, likewise, uh, I believe that the key uh, to the governance of this House is transparency, open rules, and knowing the rules, and getting on the right road to follow the rules. I want to associate myself with the words of Mr. McGovern. And that is, I hope we will have an open rule. I hope we will have an opportunity uh, to debate questions that uh, are uh, ones for ourselves, but more importantly, uh, as uh, America watches what we do, I hope that they will know that we are attempting to be as fair and as open as we possibly can be. Uh, my amendment, uh, the first amendment that I uh, offer, uh, is to correct, I think, a lack of clarity uh, in uh, the legislation. Uh, and I would hope that we would operate under the premise of you're innocent until proven guilty, but more importantly, you're not guilty by association. My amendment uh, attempts to correct is the case of a spouse or a child of a wayward member. Uh, the bill uh, now is so loosely drafted that the Office of Personnel Management reasonably could infer that the Congress is authorizing the agency in its discretion to deny to the innocent spouse or innocent children of a wayward member eligibility to receive benefits to which they would otherwise be entitled. There is nothing in the bill that requires OPM to make a determination that the conduct of the spouse or the children is as culpable as that of their spouse or parent. The fundamental deficiency is not mitigated by the fact that the bill as written permits but does not require OPM to promulgate regulations permitting a spouse or child of a dishonored member to receive the benefits to which they would be otherwise entitled only if OPM thinks eligibility should be restored given the totality of the circumstances. I don't know about um, that kind of loose definition, uh, but I think uh, that uh, having considerable experience in the practice and the making of the law, this hardly sounds like the presumption of innocence or the burden of proof being borne by the government. It means that in this stressful time, uh, the child or the parent may have the burden of proving they did nothing. We certainly do not want to uh, include benefits to those culpable individuals, but we should not infer guilt, presume culpability, or suspect wrongful behavior. After all, the bill requires affirmative evidence and proof beyond a reasonable doubt that the member has engaged in conduct warranting a forfeiture of his retirement benefits, his or her. It does this by limiting the forfeiture provision only to members who have been convicted of felonious conduct. We need to make it very clear that innocent spouses and children are not prohibited from receiving the benefits. We're going to demand the highest standard of proof for a convicted felon. We cannot in good conscience require a lesser standard for that member's spouse and children. The sins of that parent should not be visited on the children or the spouse. In our zeal to demonstrate our outrage at the conduct of members who breach the public trust, let us not breach our own commitment to fundamental principles of fairness and due process that have served this nation well. And so I would hope that we would uh, provide clear language, which this amendment uh, does, to ensure that the innocent spouse and child uh, is not negatively impacted by this legislation. Let me quickly go to my second amendment, Madam Chair, and I thank you very much for your indulgence. And that is uh, that my uh, particular amendment uh, strikes the language uh, regarding uh, travel, uh, the travel ban, as I understand it, for the 106th Congress. And in saying that and being provocative, 109th Congress, uh, it must have been a good year for me, maybe so. Um, uh, but um, the 109th Congress, let, let me share with you, uh, because uh, everyone um, finds this to be one of the more uh, attractive uh, provisions. And I do note that it says through the 109th, it may be to survey what is going on. Uh, but what I would say is that um, I believe that every member uh, welcomes the transparency and maybe the pre-approval of any uh, CODEL or uh, private funded CODEL uh, that they would uh, uh, take. But let me say to you that I believe truly that in this time of stress, strife, and discord in the world, the engagement of members internationally is crucial. Uh, the ban on travel would include trips by APAC. It would include trips by uh, foundations that are interested in democratization in places where there is no democracy. Members play a very large role in engaging internationally. In fact, you will find when we do travel internationally, most of our hosts will say, where have you been? And so I, I just think that this is a harsh provision. Uh, this throws the baby out with the bathwater. Uh, and what I would offer instead is an opportunity for members to show extreme transparency. And I use the word extreme, meaning that 
whatever the procedures will be put in place by this House, but you will be blocking members from going on any, um, and I use APAC as an example, but any other funded, foundation-type funded international um, efforts uh, to engage internationally and to be able to secure facts. I will use uh, uh, one example, and that is uh, in uh, traveling uh, to uh, determine the facts of genocide uh, in the Sudan region. Uh, many members have been uh, traveling uh, as sponsored by foundations, uh, particularly uh, in the religious community. Uh, that would be denied. Uh, to find out who uh, is killing whom and how many are dying, or how many are dying in Ethiopia because of the drought, uh, sometimes funded by private foundations, I would just uh, argue to my colleagues uh, a consideration of what I know is uh, possibly a party line support uh, and uh, may not be welcomed by uh, my uh, expression, but I hope we can do this in a bipartisan manner and that we can put the onus on members to be responsible for any invitation to make sure that it is vetted by the Ethics Committee, vetted by the House leadership, vetted by their committees to ensure that the th only thing that they do is represent their constituents in the United States of America in the best way possible. I would ask that my amendments be considered, and I yield back. Thank you. I thank both of you. I think you've, um, your amendments in different ways have addressed one of the more difficult issues, and that is how to treat travel. And I agree with Mrs. Waters. I think that uh, educational institutions are absolutely imperative that we travel and that we uh, share our knowledge and uh, hear what students of tomorrow, of today and tomorrow and future leaders have to say. And I think you brought up an excellent point. Uh, I have no questions. Mr. Sessions, do you have any questions? Mr. McGovern? No, I want to thank you both for being here, and I certainly support your amendments on the issue of travel. Um, you know, clearly, I think there's a, a majority consensus that this banning it or punting it and deal with it at some other day in the future is not the way to go. And so I hope that those amendments have made an order. And Ms. Waters, I just, <clears throat> I just want to say that I think one of the, one of the shameful aspects of the way this is uh, coming before us is that it seems that the bipartisan amendments that were adopted, um, you know, are the ones that have been stripped from the bill. Uh, the chairman of this distinguished committee at the very beginning said, well, I'm trying to do this in a bipartisan way. Well, if so, then why are bipartisan amendments that are adopted in various committees being removed? Um, this whole issue about disclosure, lobbyist disclosure of contact with members of Congress and with um, members of, of certain staff, uh, quite frankly, is necessary because we don't follow the rules of this House. This is a very closed process. This is no longer a deliberative process. We have bills that come to us that are like this big, where, the, where, the, where, the, where the, re, the rule that requires us to be able to review it before it goes to the floor uh, is routinely waived. And then we find out that certain things have been put into bills. We had a situation on the Homeland Security Bill in the 107th Congress that protected Eli Lilly and a number of other pharmaceutical companies from civil liability uh, for the production of the vaccine preservative uh, Thimerosal. Um, you know, how, who put it there? How did it get there? I mean, without a, without a, without a deliberative process in which you are discussing these things in advance, um, you know, you need this, requ you need this report and requirements, you know, who's responsible? Um, you know, the, uh, the notorious Green Bonds Initiative that appeared in the Energy Bill Conference Report in the 108th Congress, which turned out to be a subsidy to build a Hooters restaurant in Shreveport, Shreveport Louisiana. I mean, how the hell did that get in that bill? Um, we had a situation where, uh, you know, we, the, we, the provision in the fiscal year 2006 Agricultural Appropriations Conference report that, that changed the regulations governing the organic food standards hundreds of thousands of American families rely on when buying their groceries. And then we had uh, this example of the, uh, uh, the uh, FY06 Department of Defense uh, Appropriations Bill uh, that uh, funds our troops and military activities in Iraq and Afghanistan. And during the conference, negotiations, conferees agreed uh, in principle to include funding that would allow the Department of Health and Human Services to begin preparing a response strategy to the emerging threat of the avian influenza uh, virus. And during the discussions uh, on the provision and the conference, uh, you know, some uh, conferees supported the addition of language that would exempt drug manufacturers involved in creating the avian flu countermeasures from liability should the drugs do injury to, to the people who take them. Well, the conference did not accept that provision. Um, the conference report ended uh, and was uh, filed in the House, uh, you know, the, as, as, as it always is. And then at some point between 
you know, on its way to the White House, they added in the provision to protect these companies. And um, so, uh, you know, when I hear members of Congress, uh, certain members of Congress say, well, you know, all these reporting requirements, they will infringe on people's rights to freedom of speech and infringe on people's uh, constitutional rights to lobby their representatives. I think the answer to that is if this place, if this institution, you know, uh, lived up to what it's supposed to be, a deliberative process, an open process, where you know what you're voting on, where you know, where you're, where you're allowed to be member, part of conference committees, uh, where you could actually see the language and discuss with the particular member who inserted a, a, a particularly controversial provision, you know, we wouldn't be, you know, screaming about all this. But that's not going to happen. This place is not going to change under this leadership. And barring that, you need uh, in place strict uh, uh, reporting requirements so there's some transparency. So that not only we understand who's, who's behind uh, some of these bills um, and some of these measures in these bills, but the American people have an opportunity. So I, I support your, your amendment and I hope in fact that, uh, that they're made in order. And uh, again, I think this should be an open rule. Well, I thank you very much. If I may, uh, Madam sure. uh, Chairwoman, um, I think this bill came out of the Judiciary Committee with one vote. I voted for this bill. I can't tell you my disappointment at seeing it changed, um, uh, a different bill than I voted for. I exercised my independence right. to try and get something that I thought uh, would give us a great start in doing something about the problems uh, and some lobbying reform. But I can't tell you how disappointed I am to see the bill has been drastically changed since it left committee. And uh, unless these provisions get back in the bill, I won't vote for it. Yeah, and, I, and I think it's important for you to state that for the record, because this, this notion that somehow this has been a, a bipartisan process where, I mean, everything that seems to have been bipartisan here seems to have been thrown by the wayside. Yeah. So, I mean, let's not kid anybody here. Uh, what's going on here um, is, <laughs> is anything but bipartisan. Uh, and on a bill, with regard to the rules that will govern members of this House, this is not a process that anybody can be proud of. So I, I thank you for your thank you testimony, much. and I have no further thank questions. Thank you very much. Mr. Cole? Yes, I just want to, um, I, I do think they're really good amendments, and I hope they're made in order. And I'd also like to say uh, there are several committees of jurisdiction that were part of this bill, and Judiciary obviously is one of them, and I have to, feel that the other committees have to feel somewhat the same way, too, because bills have been passed out of their committees, and um, I kind of feel that it's kind of a cut and paste job in a sense, and that's unfortunate because uh, several people like you decided to move forward, and let's see if we can move to a, toward a bipartisan consensus, and in good faith, you try to do that, and, um, and we saw what happened here, and that's unfortunate because I feel that when somebody tries to do that and, in, es in essence, um, has been rejected to a great degree here uh, by this bill, um, I think that the only approach we can possibly take is to have an open rule. That's right. Because, in essence, what you try to do in committee, and I think in the other committees too, in a bipartisan manner uh, with bipartisan agreement has been taken apart. Right. So I think we all, in a sense, need to start all over. So I do really um, salute you for doing what you did, and I hope that we can have an open rule. Thank you very much. If I may uh, comment on your uh, point about the open rule, um, I think um, the, um, intents, uh, the intentions are good with respect to the language of the bill, um, but the fact that there are large missing elements and also a lack of clarity, which is one of the reasons why I offer the amendment to clarify that innocent spouses and innocent children uh, should not be denied benefits and that the direction uh, to OPM should come from us uh, and it should be transparent. So I hope there is an open rule so that we can debate these issues. Thank you very much. Thank you. But, uh, Dr. Gingrich, do you have any questions? Mr. Garrett. Thank you. 
and good afternoon. And I, too, uh, appreciate the work of this committee on a very important topic. Um, I don't envy the committee, but I appreciate the uh, work of the committee. I have, um, I will be brief, I have four amendments that I will just run through um, with you, if I may. Going in reverse order chronologically, or numerically, number 87, number 87, goes to the issue of who may be uh, a lobbyist. And currently, the citizens of this country have the right to petition and uh, seek redress and hire lobbyists to do so. We are simply suggesting that when they go out and they do hire a lobbyist, that that lobbyist should be someone beyond reproach, and that should be someone who has not already been convicted of and a felony conviction for other lobbying reforms. So in essence, and in final in conclusion, number, amendment number 87 simply bars convicted felons from registering as lobbyists, a position that should be held by persons of high ethical standards. Following that is amendment number 86, another um, what I think is a common sense uh, amendment. But then again, I always think all the amendments I come before the Rules Committee are common sense amendments. Um, and this goes to which um, the, the breadth of the, uh, of the bill as far as earmark reform. We believe that all forms of spending under appropriation should be covered. As we know, in the past, this House has unfortunately had to deal with um, not doing all the appropriations bills at one time for various reasons and having to come to, at the end of the year, omnibus bills, which is called a continuing resolution. And under the bill, as I understand it right now, although we would get earmark re reform in the individual bills as they go through as, a, as an appropriation bill, or even one that comes back from a conference report on that appropriation, as a conference um, report on that appropriation matter, if, however, we are not forever, for some reason, able to get the, all the appropriations bills done in a particular year, and you do get a continuing resolution at the end of the year under the bill as it's worded right now, that'll just be a, a haven, if you will, an attraction point for all of our earmarks that didn't get put in during the course of the year and plugged right in there. So we're just suggesting that continuing resolutions should have the same rules applied to them as the rest of the appropriation matters. The next one is amendment number 85. Currently, um, the bill defines a GSE, a government-sponsored entity, as a federal entity, which has implications all in and of itself. But as it applies here, by making it a federal entity, it will therefore be exempt from any and all of the earmark reforms that we're doing. Now, I've tried to find out exactly why that provision was put in here because well, first of all, as I say, there's all sorts of other implications by defining groups such as Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, which is a GSC as a federal entity. They have always said, and when Financial Services Committee, we say this all the time, they are not part of the federal government. They are separate government-sponsored entities. So by defining them in this legislation, I think we're opening up a whole new Pandora's box as that goes. But also, by defining them as a federal entity in this action, they are exempt from any of our earmark reforms, which once again would say that they would not come under the same rules and again would might make them an attractive place for earmarks. Now, in my short tenure here, I've never seen earmarks apply to uh, GSEs, Fannies and Freddies, or any other GSEs as well. I have not, c cannot get anybody to say where there's been a history of where earmarks goes to um, GSEs. So for the life of me, I'm just not clear why the bill says that GSEs are going to be a federal entity and exempt from um, earmark reform. And I would simply, under amendment number 85, simply would strike that language and have them come under the same purview as anything else. The fourth one goes to the heart of what we're trying to do here uh, under earmark reform. And that is to say, how do we get the most transparency in all of the actions that we do when it comes to our dollars and cents this Congress deals with? Right now, as you know, the legislation deals only with appropriation matters, which on the list of the uh, egregious examples that you were giving before, I think most of those, um, I didn't listen to all of them con candidly, but most of them are come under appropriation. Yeah, some of them don't too, so. so, there you go. So we're, we're suggesting that we should broaden it to um, any, any revenue source. So it, go, it would apply to tax bills as, re, as revenues uh, increasing bills, which is tax bills, where we have all sorts of measures that come uh, at the la last minute as well in, in both matters and any other uh, committees related bills as well. Uh, the idea is that just as we want to have transparency, the proverbial light of day shine on appropriation matters, shouldn't it also be the case that we have transparency in the light of day and all the other information come out with regard to uh, all other appropriating or all other authorizing bills as well. And um, that, Madam Chairman, 
is uh, my four bills, and I appreciate your consideration on each or any one of them. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. And we'll hear from Mr. Obey, and then we'll open to questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I want to talk about some different things. And what I want to do is, again, start by quoting Otis Pike, who served in this place many years ago, and said this the last time that Congress was considering ethics reform. He said, you can talk about ethics forever and pass more rules and reveal yourselves until all of your and your spouse's finances, food, drink, sex, religion, clothing, vacations, and the hours and minutes and places of your arising and retiring are public records, but you will never be held in high regard or deemed ethical while you say you can't balance a budget unless a constitutional amendment makes you, while you accept gloriously optimistic economic projections rather than deal with real ones, while you write a Graham Rudman bill and then spend days finding ways to get around it, while you let one man make $550 million a year while, while thousands sleep in the streets. Now, what Otis was saying when he said that is don't engage in trivial pursuit. And with all due respect, that's what I think a large portion of the bill before us does. As I said last time I was for the committee, I really don't care whether the uh, whether a lobbyist can buy you a $20 dinner or a $0 dinner, so long as uh, an organization represented by that lobbyist can give you $5,000 in a campaign contribution. So my advice is don't sweat the small stuff. Focus on the stuff that really discredits this institution. And having said that, let me cite uh, uh, some of the things I think they are. First of all, let me warn you about some unintended consequences. I know there is a lust on the part of many in this institution to require that every single earmark be listed. But as the gentleman sitting next to me indicated, all forms of spending under appropriations, that's what he was concerned about with respect to earmarks. What about other forms of spending? What about the spending that occurs in tax bills? What about the spending that occurs in authorization bills? The bridge to nowhere was in an authorization bill. It was not in an appropriation bill. I've got some items I will uh, shortly report, uh, give you examples about in the tax bill of 1986. Some pretty outrageous stuff and some pretty expensive stuff. This bill doesn't lay a glove on that stuff. Doesn't lay a glove on it. Uh, but I would also uh, warn you about unintended consequences. If you require <clears throat> every member to list his appropriations earmarks in an appropriation bill, then over time, I believe that is going to encourage more, not fewer earmarks, because members are going to be in a competition back home to show who has the longest list. And if you have a short list, your staff is going to be on you like an ape, saying, by God, you've got to ask for more projects. You've got to get more projects, because old Harry down the, down the road, uh, 30 miles away in, a, in an adjoining district, uh, he's outdoing you, boy. And so you're going to have that, that problem. I would make a flat prediction. Um, secondly, I would say that uh, uh, if you do require, uh, or if you allow an amendment which requires that a lobbyist list all of his contacts with members, I want to tell you a little story. In Wisconsin, when I was in the legislature, we had a, a lobbyist by the name of Charlie Breeze who was blind. He, was a he lobbied for a couple of conservation accounts. Now, in Wisconsin, the rule is uh, no lobbyist can even get a member of the legislature a cup of coffee. But what old Charlie did, and he was the subject of a grand jury investigation, uh, he, his activities triggered a grand jury investigation of the entire legislature. What old Charlie did, he took advantage of the fact that some of his clients didn't know that it was illegal to buy members of, of the legislature a cup of coffee. So he padded his expense accounts and listed all kinds of expenditures that he supposedly made on behalf of legislators, none of which were true. 
but it took a grand jury investigation to find out. So my point is, if you're going to require the lobbyist to report, you had doggone well better require that the lobbyist notify the member so that the member knows he's been named. Otherwise, you can have lots of fun and games played by people who want to, who want to pad their expense accounts. And it's going to be at the expense of all of us in the House. So I would think that through a little more carefully than I, than I think some people have thought it through. Uh, while I'm at the table, I'd, I'd like to suggest uh, that I think that the, the, the proposal by Mr. Lundgren and Mr. Miller was perfectly reasonable. Uh, it is not quite identical to the proposal that, that, uh, that uh, we offered and, and which has been included in the slaughter amendment, but in some ways it may be marginally better. And so what I would suggest, if the slaughter amendment is going to be made in order, and I certainly hope it is, if it is, uh, one way you can make sure that parties don't one-up each other on this issue is if you, if, if you allow that amendment, and if that amendment is adopted, you could arrange this rule so that if that amendment is adopted, amending the core bill, it could also automatically amend the slaughter amendment at the same time. That way, you've got no party playing games trying to one-up the other party on this issue. You've just got people honestly trying to work for a solution. And that's what I would suggest you consider. Uh, uh, on, on the issue of, uh, of, uh, of specific dollar amounts, I'm tired and I don't remember if I already said this or not. But when these disclosure rules were written, and I wrote them, I wrote them back in 75. When these disclosure rules were written, there was a reason that we listed ranges rather than specific amounts. Because we wanted disclosure to measure conflict of interest, not net worth. We were not, in try, uh, not trying to encourage press voyeurism about how much somebody was worth. We were trying to measure conflict of interest. So that's, now you can argue with the ranges, and I've always thought they're too broad. But I would think carefully about, uh, uh, about the adjustments that you make in those. Now having said that, I want to urge that you uh, uh, make in order the slaughter amendment, which I stand four square behind, because uh, in my view, that amendment does not play trivial pursuit. It goes after some of the basic problems in this place. And I want to go specifically to earmark. Uh, the bill before the House today does nothing to stop the embarrassment that uh, fell upon this Congress because of the poster child of all earmarks, that bridge to nowhere. Uh, in that bill does nothing about uh, authorization earmarks, even though the 2005 highway bill provided $24 billion for more than 5,000 earmarks. And that is seven times more than the $3.4 billion that were spent on all earmarks in last year's Treasury Transport Appropriation Bill, and including all transportation projects, not just highway earmarks, and all HUD EDI appropriations earmarks as well. So the authorizing committee had seven times the amount. Uh, this bill does nothing whatsoever to stop the fleecing of the taxpayer by listing earmarks in tax bills. Uh, and as I pointed out when I testified for the committee, Last year's bill fixing the $5 billion foreign sales corporation tax problem added $6.5 billion worth of tax earmarks. It added 24 limited tax benefits for specific uh, shopping mall developers, ceiling fan importers, NASCAR track uh, owners, bow and arrow manufacturers, U.S. horse and dog racing establishments, fishing uh, box manufacturers. Where is the reform uh, in this bill that deals with those trinkets. I see it not. Um, uh, and let me go back to the 1986 tax reform bill. That baby included 340 separate transition rules, each benefiting a small set of individuals and in total costing $10.6 billion. It provided limited tax breaks to the following small businesses. General Motors, Chrysler, uh, Commonwealth Edison, Phillips Petroleum, a number of steel companies, various universities, 
uh, sports stadiums in Buffalo, Tampa, San Francisco, Denver, Cleveland, and L.A., and it provided a special rule for a millionaire stockbroker with the largest private collection of Rodin sculpture and a Chicago family listed by Forbes magazine as one of the 400 richest in America. That's all that little baby did. And the bill before us doesn't do one whit to deal with that ripoff. So I would suggest if you're going to go after earmarks, number one, recognize unintended consequences and go after them all. My record is clear. I come from the generation that opposed all earmarks and appropriation bills because I agreed that they would get this place into institutional trouble, and they have. But if you're going to go at them, if you're not going to be a Percy Pureheart about it and wipe them all out, then by God, go after the biggies. Don't go. Who cares if you got a little $100,000 after school program for your district? Compare that to a special under the table, behind the scenes, behind the curtain, uh, big ripoff for General Motors or Chrysler or, 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 or some other uh, oil companies. Um, and then I would say recognize this place in the end is judged by what comes out of conference committees. The House can screw up, the Senate can screw up, the conference is supposed to be what saves this place as an institution. But if you don't protect the integrity of that conference process, then we get smeared with the result. And that's how you get an appropriation bill for agriculture that arbitrarily changes the definition for organic foods. A multi-million dollar gift to the special interest produced through the process of immaculate conception. Because nobody in this institution has yet fessed up to the fact that they supported it. I think who the, I, I know who the lobbyist was, but I can't prove it, so I can't mention her name. <coughs> Let me, um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if, I so could, if I could just uh, say one, we, we've got some other amendments, uh, and we're, we're going to be running into votes fairly soon. All right, so. just, all right just, one, just, just one more sentence. The most egregious abuse of the process in the last five years, outside of holding open the, uh, the roll call for three hours, was what happened on the defense appropriation bill when the majority leader of the Senate, despite the fact that we had been assured verbally and in writing that there would be no indemnification of the uh, pharmaceutical industry. Despite that fact, the majority leader of the Senate, Senator Frist, marched across the Capitol after the conference was closed and demanded that 40 pages of legislation be in inserted, which went far beyond the way it was described and provided massive indemnification for the pharmaceutical industry. The problem that leads to most embarrassment, the way that you have an Abramoff or anybody else take advantage of this place is if we don't stick to the rules and if we don't have rules that protect the individual prerogative of the most lowly member in this place, which is why at de minimis, any bill that contains any earmarks should lay over for three days so that the average member can take a look at it so he doesn't have to be shoved into voting for something by the leadership in either party. Unless you do that, you're taking Otis Pike's advice and throwing it in the ash can and doing just the opposite. You're chasing trivia, and this place is going to pay the price because it's going to look totally irrelevant and cynical. And one last point. <coughs> for God's sake, don't delay what you do on travel until after the election. That is a cop-out. I know this place, and I know the people in it. There are a hell of a lot of people here who want to keep going on their golf trips to Scotland and a dozen other places. And the only way you're going to stop that garbage is if you distinguish between travel which is legitimate and travel which is clearly illegitimate and make those distinctions now. The Ethics Committee was not created to write the Code of Ethics. The Ethics Committee was created to enforce the so this committee has the responsibility to write the rules, and then the Ethics Committee has the right to enforce it. Don't use the existence of the Ethics Committee as an excuse to put travel reform off until after the election. That will just make this place look even worse than it does today. Thank you. Thank you. And I have no questions. Mr. Sessions? I think both members have 
present and had an opportunity to present a lot of good information. I'm not sure I agree with uh, everything that was said because I'm not sure that there is really one answer to the whole thing. Uh, I do share concerns that banning all travel is a bad thing. Uh, I disagree with perhaps the amendment that you agreed with that does ban all travel. We don't ban all travel. We ban lobbyist financed travel. I'm totally against banning all travel. I chaired the Foreign Operations Subcommittee for 10 years. I passionately believe that the more you can encourage members to travel, the, the, the more you reduce illiteracy when it comes to foreign policy. Yeah. And I think it's going to be, uh, it's a darn tough thing to sit there and then say, which group is it okay to send to Arctic National Wildlife Reserve? And if it's, if it's one group, it's okay. And if it's another, it's not okay. So I just really appreciate that this committee is here to make sure that we try and listen to all the arguments. And I think you all have made cogent arguments about what you believe. And I'm, it's, it's going to be a difficult task for us, but I really do want to achieve some balance, and I appreciate hearing from both of you uh, today on this. Thank you. Ms. Slaughter? Thank you. And Mr. Obi, you are a wonderfully wise member with good memory, good institutional memory here. Uh, and I think that we all long to get back on an even keel on both sides of the aisle. I certainly appreciate the support on the substitute, and I think it's critically important that it be made in order Otherwise, we are only going to debate a bill that has been denigrated by every outside source in the country. And we, I don't think we want to do that. I think that's going to make us look really, really bad. Uh, and certainly looks as though we have no intent here to really change anything. And I agree with you. If you talk about just holding until the end of the year, that's obviously until after the election when we would go back to business as usual. That would be most, most destructive. And Mr. Garrett, I thought your amendments were very thoughtful. And as I understood, Mr. Garrett, uh, you did deal with all earmarks, not just the ones on appropriations. Uh, and, I, and so he does cover that very well, and I, I, I think that was very good, very thoughtful work. So thank you both. Uh, I, but it is important that we have either an open rule or that substitute is allowed. Otherwise, uh, half of this country is going to be pretty sore about it, uh, all those the people we represent who've had nothing to say. and. Uh, that would just put us back in the awful stew we've been trying to get out of here for some time. Thank you. Dr. Kingry. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, Mr. Obie, you are a experienced, thoughtful member, and I enjoyed your speech. Uh, Mr. Garrett, I want to say that uh, of your amendments, I agree with Ms. Slaughter, uh, particularly amendments one and two, uh, and to bring up the point about the continuing resolutions and the possibility of uh, Loading those up with earmarks is something that I had not thought of, and I and I think that's a good thoughtful amendment. And I made an order. Could I could, could I warn you about one thing that he just raised? The House and the Senate have very different interests on this, and under some of the proposals being tossed out, the earmarks that are going to be uh, subject to point of order, for instance, would be those that were in a conference. Now, in some cases, there has been a very good reason why the House has not put appropriations earmarks in the original bill. Because if you do, that means that the Senate and the, the two institutions fight each other in order to, in order to wind up with a, with a result that, that favors them. But if the House puts its earmarks in legislation in June, and then they sit out there with the Senate able to hold them ransom and, and fiddle with them until September. And then if the Senate brings their appropriation bill up in September, and then three days later you're in conference, that means there is never any meaningful review of the Senate earmarks, and there is exquisitely careful review of the House earmarks. I don't know if the House wants to put itself at that kind of disadvantage. Mr. McGovern? First, I want to thank you both for uh, for your testimony. I agree with most, if not all, of what has been said here. Um, um, and I just, uh, Mr. Obi's point about following the rules again. I, for the life of me, I, I I think a lot of the I don't understand why 
Um, this bill is not more concerned with making sure that the powers that be in this chamber actually follow the rules. I mean, we, we routinely waive that three-day holdover on the bill, so no one knows what's in the bill. Uh, even the people who are supposed to know don't know what's in the, what's in the bill. Uh, and you mentioned the issue about the conference committees and the little sweetheart deal that was put in to provide liability uh, 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 protection to a, uh, one of the drug companies. Uh, I mean, uh, all this stuff that kind of goes on, um, you know, which I think a lot of it could be avoided if, in fact, uh, we understood that uh, th there was a connection between a lot of these ethics scandals, a lot of the corruption, and the breakdown of the deliberative process in this House. I mean, it is, it is so in your face that there's a connection that it takes my breath away. I can't quite understand why we just kind of pussyfoot around that subject. The second thing is, and maybe you could just both explain it. I mean, um, you know, I, if, if we're going to, if we're going to uh, require, um, you know, accountability on appropriations to earmarks, I absolutely believe we should do it with regard to tax bills and to authorization bills. What, what, I mean, and I'm reading in the Congressional Quarterly that the uh, majority leader is saying, well, we'll do it next year, but what, what, is the, what is the hesitation to doing this all together? I mean, who's, who's out there, is it out there undermining this, this effort uh, for complete accountability? Does anyone have any idea? I mean, who's, who's behind this effort to, you know, keep tax breaks off the, uh, off the table in terms of accountability or, you know, or authorizations or liability protections? Well, I know you don't want to take much time. I'll, I'll just say this, that, and I'm not an expert on the rules. I understand that it is a little more complicated, and that's why I defer to this committee as far as the language that I've submitted in my uh, amendment here, um, that it is a little more complicated um, to facilitate language that will get to the revenue side of the equation than it is simply to go to the appropriation side. And so that, that may be to give all benefit of the doubt to the other side on this issue may be part of the problem. Let me challenge that. The CRS took a year and a half to try to define what an appropriation is they finally decided that they needed separate definitions for each of the 13 bills because each of the bills were so different. So don't let anybody tell me it's more complicated than your taxes. Yeah. Yeah, well, and let me just respectfully suggest that I think it's more important for us to do this right rather than just to do it because we want to do something tomorrow. I mean, you know, we've gone through this process. I mean, Mr. Obies testified before he had many of the same points you raised today. You know, about uh, you know the, the some of the abuses that have occurred with the authorization process and, and tax breaks. I mean, you, you, you've been on record. I got great quotes from you all through my notes here. Um, the fact of the matter is, uh, this is not the first time this committee or anybody is hearing about this. So, I mean, why don't we just do it right? I mean, th this this notion that somehow oh we can't do it because we got to be on the floor tomorrow or maybe it's complicated. I mean, let's let's do this once. Let's do it right. Uh, let's get it right. And at the end of the day, uh, if we add to that, making sure we follow the rules of the House and stop running this place uh, like it's an exclusive club only for a few people where the rest of us are all shut out um, and a little bit more open process, I think we can fix this. Uh, so um, I appreciate uh, your comments and, um, and I hope that this committee, you know, as, as a gesture of good faith to you, uh, has an open process on the House floor, which I doubt very much. This institution doesn't get into trouble because it's ripped off by, by the least powerful members. That's right. <laughs> People who rip this place off go to the most powerful members. And that's why the rules are Thank you. Ms. Matsui? Uh, I want to thank both of you for coming. And um, I thought this was such a thoughtful discussion. I think it's unfortunate that we can't have this process of kind of cross pollinating when we try to figure out how to look at the rules and what we do with it because I learned so much here today and every time you come I learn a lot and I feel like sometimes we're going to go into some unintended consequences because we're just going to make some decisions and move forward just because of because we need to do it in a hasty manner so thank you very much and keep plugging away if I may just enter something into the record uh, yes. for 10 seconds, and that is on the First Amendment no number 84, which is the last one we talked about, uh, my original understanding was that uh, Member John Shattuck was on alongside of me. He has asked not to be, um, so this is just my amendment and not John's as well. Thank you. We are within five minutes of voting. If Mr. Davis and Mr. Waxman can present in five minutes, or we can uh, go into recess and uh, join. Okay, quick. First of all, we uh, support a strong bipartisan bill out of our committee, 32 to nothing. It ought to be attached to this. Frankly, if you want a bipartisan bill, attaching an amendment like this is a good way to get credibility. We're trying to help help the leadership with doing this. 
Our amendment um, that Mr. Waxman's staff and our committee staff wrote together requires executive branch officials to disclose uh, to the Office of Government Ethics on a quarterly basis significant contacts between official and private parties relating to uh, official government action, require the OGE to maintain a publicly accessible database for this information. It prohibits high-ranking executive officials from making official decisions that affect the financial interest of the official's former private sector employer. We extend to two years the current one-year ban against contacts with federal government agencies made by certain high-ranking executive branch officials to influence policy after they leave federal employment. Uh, high-ranking executive branch officials from interacting in an official manner with an organization with whom they're pursuing prospective employment unless a waiver is granted. Extended two years and expand the coverage of the current one-year restriction against former federal procurement officers accepting compensation from a federal contractor for which the procurement official had worked when a federal employee. Prohibit federal employees from spending federal funds on federal propaganda within the U.S. It's not authorized by law. We require the full disclosure of government sponsorship of communications. Um, we do for the legislative branch, uh, the executive branch reform act will provide transparency to the operations. What we're saying is uh, basically people should get there by their, uh, be hired for the quality of their intellect, not their Rolodex. Mr. Waxman. <laughs> Thank you both, uh, Chairman, for recognizing me. And I uh, want to join with uh, Chairman Davis in supporting this proposal. It passed our committee 32 to 0. It's not usual these days for the Congress to get together on a bipartisan proposal, but every member of our committee supported it. And with the Chairman Davis's leadership, exactly what our, our committee achieved, landmark reform legislation that deals with the um, executive branch. And I believe the executive branch is in desperate need of ethics reform, as is the Congress. So I would uh, urge uh, support for our proposal, either as an amendment to the uh, bill or as a, or as a standalone. Yeah, we take a freestanding vote on this. I think it would pass overwhelmingly, and uh, we need to do this kind of thing. Mm. I appreciate both of you. I support your amendment and hope it's made in order. I also support your amendment and hope it's made in order, too. Thank you. I would like to say in the interest of time, I don't want to diminish the importance of your amendment uh, because I do think it raises an important issue. I appreciate, all, appreciate your patience, and uh, the, committee stands at your, uh, the committee stands in recess. Uh, so we go through committees of jurisdiction and then seniority is, is uh, the structure that we follow here. So, uh, Mr. Shays, please come forward and uh, without objection, your uh, prepared statement will appear in the record in its entirety and we welcome your summary. Uh, thank you very much. Mr. Chairman. So just to, just to, we're uh, on the government reform, committee on government reform now, I'll say to Mike and then uh, our plan is, is that we'll proceed with uh, members, and Mr. Leach is the first one up at the top of that list, because he's a pretty senior guy, as we all know. Please proceed, Mr. Chairman. Thank Chase. you, Mr. Chairman. It's been over a decade since uh, the party I represent uh, became the majority. I feel like we've forgotten how we got here. 
Republicans were united by three ish common issues, enact tax reform, grow the economy, and reform the Congress. It was amazing that after the 2004 election, we considered repealing the rule requiring a Republican leader to step down if indicted. Next, we proceeded to remove the members of our ethics committee who had voted to hold our former majority leader accountable for his actions. And then we proceeded to make it more difficult to initiate an ethics committee investigation. Why am I mentioning that? Because these are outrageous things we did and we need to undo them. Uh, there is a tendency, in my judgment, for power to corrupt and absolute power to corrupt absolutely. And I think it is here present in this place. I would like this committee to consider five reforms that Congressman Meehan and I and others have proposed. One, create an office of public integrity, a professional office that would investigate all complaints uh, and then would be adjudicated by uh, the members of Congress. Second, strengthen lobby disclosure requirements beyond what this legislation includes. Three, require disclosure of huge sums being spent by professional lobby firms and lobby organizations on grassroots campaigns to stimulate lobbying by members of Congress. Four, require members to pay for charter flights they took rather than paying a first class fare. This to me is one of the most outrageous of all outrageous facts. What we have is we have members of Congress who have sweetheart relationships with corporations that send them all around the country. They are the leaders in the House and in the Senate, minority and majority, and then most senators. And somehow we, we're saying we're going to crack down on lobbyists, but we'll allow this huge loophole to still exist. Fly with someone an airplane, but you only have to pay $1,000 or so, or when it costs tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars. I would also respectfully request that we enact a gift ban. I would also like to express support for an amendment offered by Appropriations Chairman Lewis, who has suggested that rules requiring more disclosure for earmarks apply to all committees instead of just the Appropriations Committee. Uh, it strikes me as unbelievable that a Vietnam War hero would become a traitor by corruption in this place, and it was done by earmarks. And we have the same thing suggested and probably real of the ranking member of the Ethics Committee. And we're wondering why we shouldn't address this issue. Think about it a second. The ranking member of the Ethics Committee has been sitting for a year preventing Mr. Hastings from taking action and blaming it on Mr. Hastings when in fact he may have been doing the very same things Mr. Cunningham was involved in. Other than that, we're doing really well in Congress. We're doing really well here, guys. This place has a huge problem, and it can't just be, we'll take an incremental step. It needs to be huge, it needs to be significant, and we need to deal with it. Otherwise, we are not morally fit to run this place. And if I say that to my majority party, there is no indication that the minority party has shown any, frankly, any difference than our party. I think collectively on a bipartisan basis, we need to wake up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Shays. Let me, uh, let me say at the, uh, at the outset, as, as you know, uh, when I called you when given this task in early January by the speaker, um, we unveiled uh, some of the bold reforms uh, about which you've spoken. And frankly, if one goes through and looks at the package that we have, it's very clear that we've included those. I know that there's been criticism leveled by a number of outside organizations. But I was very pleased to have spent time with the leadership of Democracy 21 and Common Cause and looked at some of the issues that they raised. They recommended that we make sure that members of Congress, former members of Congress who are registered lobbyists, not have access to the House floor and the gym. We know as at their recommendation, we have uh, included that. They also recommended that we move from semi-annual to quarterly filing of reports from lobbyists. That is included in this legislation. We know that they have said that we need to make sure that we clearly have transparency when it comes to the issue of individual lobbyists who make campaign contributions in that link there. My argument is that this is the beginning of a process. We have this as an HR because we will be going to a conference with the House and the Senate to address this bill. And I think that there, uh, am I perfectly happy with every single provision in this bill? 
It's not exactly what I wanted from the beginning. One of the challenges that we deal with here is trying to work in a bipartisan way, and I'm very happy to continue working with Democrats as I have from the very beginning. I mean, when I talked with, with you, Chris, I also talked with Marty Meehan, I talked with a number of other Democrats in the leadership. I tried to talk to some Democrats who immediately indicated to me that they had no interest in talking uh, with me or dealing on this issue. Um, but we are still trying to put together a package that will allow us to have the votes necessary to bring about institutional reform. So I'm simply trying to do the very best that we can. And you've made a number of recommendations which we've incorporated. And uh, I believe that we've made steps in that direction. And who knows, maybe within the uh, conference we'll be able to uh, address more. So I have no, uh, no Mr. questions. Mr. Chairman, but could I just respond and say clearly. that you've got an easy solution to your quandary of, of not having cooperation on either side of the aisle. Oh, I didn't say I don't have cooperation. I, there are a number of Democrats with whom I've been able to work very closely on this and had a great deal of cooperation. Well, let me put it a different and many Republicans with whom I've been able to work closely on this. And Talking I'm very happy about, about putting that. putting together a package. Why not do something that I grew up thinking happened in this place? Why not have an open debate about all these issues? Why not have every member stand on this? Okay. Why not have Nancy Pelosi have to decide up or down whether she should be allowed on a plane paid by a corporation when she goes after corporations? Why not have my own speaker have to deal with it? Why not have a vote on that? Well, let me just, let me just say what this committee process has consisted of so far. You know that this began really the 1st of January. And we wanted to move as expeditiously as possible. And when the Speaker and I unveiled our plan, we talked about the need to address this by early March, if possible. And here we are now in late April. And the reason that we're here is that we've gone through regular order. Five committees of jurisdiction have spent a great deal of time on this issue. The Rules Committee held three original jurisdiction hearings. You testified to one of those, basically with the testimony that you've offered here today, talking about those issues then. Similarly, the Government Reform and Oversight Committee, Mr. Hastings' Ethics Committee, the Judiciary Committee, the Administration Committee have all been involved in coming forward with a work product. And I believe that we are going to have a free and open debate on the House floor when we come to fashioning this rule. Seventy-three amendments were filed here. Many of them are duplicative, and so uh, we have to uh, work through that process. But uh, I'm convinced that just as the Speaker said, we wanted to go through regular order, which is exactly what we have done through this committee process that we've seen so far is something we can continue. So the let me proof, call on The proof of that, though, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, will be this. If you allow open and free debate, then what I've asked and others have hasn't fallen on deaf ears. But if this Well, it hasn't becomes, fallen on deaf ears. Obviously, I've, you know, I, I, I've discussed this with you through I'm the process. I'm coming before this committee to tell you I think what is coming out of this uh, committee right now is not sufficient. I think it is weak. I don't think well, it measures up. We haven't even we haven't even reported the rule out. We've got 73 amendments that we're considering. I'm talking I mean, about the bill. The bill itself. Okay. Well, the bill itself is weak. From your perspective, very weak. Thank you, Mr. Diaz Villard. <clears throat> Chairman, I have no questions. Thank you very much, Mrs. Clark. Unanimous consent for us to insert these statements for the record. Well, what are they? Members who can't uh, make it up here, Ms. Like Corello. Uh, Mr. Waxman and three editorials. New York Times, Washington Post, USA Today. Okay, without objection, Thank you. the uh, three statements will occur in the record. Mr. Shays, I, I feel really badly that you say the Democrats have been just as bad. Uh, we have a pretty strong bill here. Uh, unfortunately, it's not going anywhere. Uh, well, I'll we're vote for it. it. We're going to present it. Well, that's why it's not going to go anywhere. We want to present it as a substitute, but I think they're afraid they'd lose too many votes on it. We know already it's not going to be considered. Uh, I agree with you, and not only you, but every outside observer has said this bill is absolutely a hoax. <laughs> the idea of not even being able to deal with a gift ban is appalling. And let me say something about the, the chartered airplane. We made a mistake there. Uh, I mean, I've talked with uh, the minority leader a couple times. We, we want to change this when we get the opportunity to do it. We don't believe that we should fly on corporate airplanes, even if there's no lobbyist on it. There will be people representing that company on it. A charter a plane, for heaven's sakes, if you have to go somewhere, it'd be a lot cheaper, I would think, than paying for one of those huge corporate jets. But in any case, we don't believe that. We changed our view on that completely. We are unanimous on it. We do not want to. I thought your minority it's leader spoke out against it. It's in the bill, but it's, we want to change that her position? She changed her position. Well, I, I fear she thinks it won't pass, so she's supporting it's not, it. Look, the fact is we're not going to be able to put out our, our substitute. We know that. Uh, we worked pretty hard on it. We put, we put the substitute up here to a vote in the Rules Committee, 
and every single piece of it was voted down 9-4. I mean, I, it, we keep talking about how we want to be bipartisan, but we, all we ever get is slapped around. Uh, there's no chance here that, but I, it's more than that. I have to tell you the truth. What we're going to do tomorrow is sit here all day and debate a sham bill. It's so bad that they think that if they ask the lobbyists to uh, disclose what they're doing, that it would, would chill their work. I mean, I, I, I would hope it would. I mean, frankly, I, I'm appalled. After all the talk in January when this started, and the hearings we had here in the Rules Committee, where we brought in experts, and every one of them said that, that you know, this is terrible. Norm Orenstein had said, just as bad as the lobbyist. And let me make the point again that I've made many times before. No lobbyist broke into the Capitol. They knocked on the door, and the members allowed them in. They could not have done anything without the concurrence of the members with whom they worked. But Mr. Orenstein had said that more than anything's broken. Here's the process. Ms. Slaughter, I'm, and we want to try to deal with that. I thought your minority leader said she opposed uh, any restriction on corporate draft flights. No, she never did oppose any restrictions. She always said you had to pay the actual cost of flying. But I'm telling you that we have changed our minds in there. I appreciate it's well, in there. Good but it's, it's not going to, we, we, that is not our position any longer. Let me put it that Thank way. You. Thank You're you. You're welcome. But, you know, I, it's, uh, once again, I just, uh, drag up somebody here and say, well, they're all alike. It's just not so. Uh, I've been here now numbers of years, and I, I frankly have not seen anything to equal what we have now. The process doesn't work. But I saw you guys go after Mr. Cunningham, and then I see the ranking member of the Ethics Committee under the same charges. And what's now, well, now, wait a minute. Mr. Cunningham has been adjudicated. Mr. Monaghan is talking about... Well, it, he's talking about the increase in real estate. It's up to him and the other people who are investigating him. He's under investigation. So on Mr. The Cunningham has already been convicted he's and is gone. He's the ranking member of the Ethics Committee. Don't we get it here? He's the ranking member of the Ethics Committee. What Ethics Committee? Well, let me tell you, when, when you decided at the beginning of this term that you were going to weaken everything about ethics to protect Tom DeLay... And he prevented it from being organized. He prevented it from being... Or no, we, we, the public had an outcry out there and said, you can't do that to the Ethics Committee. But they won anyway, Chris, because we have never had a meeting. Board ...and the ranking member prevented the Ethics Committee from acting. But it falls on our shoulder, and that's why I'm saying to Republicans, we have to take action. We have to compensate for the mistakes we've made. The Democrats didn't hire, didn't fire the staff of the Ethics Committee. They, they didn't take away the, the nonpartisan professional staff. That wasn't something we did. It was something we wanted to prevent. And, and frankly, they, to this day, have not yet hired all the staff over there. This, it's not, I, I don't think anybody should try to fool themselves that we have a working Ethics Committee here. It's just not so. We certainly don't have a working ranking member of the Ethics Committee. Well, if that satisfies your need to even up the score or something. No, it's outrageous. Bless you. We've had amendments on the floor going after Republicans. Yes. And here we have this circumstance with a ranking member and nothing. And he stepped happen. aside. He's not the ranking member. Mr. Berman is. He stepped aside. He would like to have a chance to clear his name. He says, you have a problem with that? I want this Congress to start to take control and clean up itself. You know what? I, I, that's what we all want, but we don't believe under the present leadership and the way it's constituted, it's going to happen. And I think we'll see that again tomorrow. Thank you very much, Mrs. Slaughter. And uh, let me just say that uh, Mrs. Slaughter is one of those individuals to whom I uh, uh, reached out uh, when uh, this process began. And uh, you can see the reaction that I got. Mr. diaz Villard. I don't have any questions, but I appreciate the gentleman's testimony. Uh, please uh, 
whatever prepared remarks you have will, without objection, appear in the record in their entirety, and we welcome your summary. Thank you for being Thank here, Chairman. Thanks for I'll being be so very brief. I respect very much your uh, efforts and your leadership. Thank you. Uh, all I've done is uh, look at the approaches and that have been on the table and uh, in my own mind have suggested two possible additions that are outside the scope of the current kinds of things you're looking at, Mr. Chairman. Uh, one relates uh, uh, to uh, internet gambling, which I think is an unfinished business of uh, the Congress that relates to some of the underlying uh, problems that have, have caused an, an ethical dilemma in the Congress. Uh, and uh, all I can suggest to you is that uh, uh, the Banking Committee has produced in five Congresses an internet gambling restraint bill. Uh, once it was allowed to be voted on the floor, passed very strongly. A second time, a bill came from the Senate, uh, uh, and under uh, Mr. Goodlatte's guidance, was allowed to vote on the floor. It carried a, a majority, but not a two-thirds vote uh, at that time. Uh, and so we've been hamstrung on that issue. Uh, but given the circumstances that have uh, led to some of the ethics problems, I, I would argue this might be the type of thing that might uh, add more respect to your bill if you included it in it. And I would tell you it was a matter that the Senate was prepared to include in their bill, uh, but given the, the debates that occurred, they suddenly cut off debate uh, looking at a small number of amendments. This was apparently the next one to be considered, and it wasn't considered on the Senate side, but there was uh, that intent. Uh, I would think it, it might be very helpful for you to consider it. Uh, and finally, let me just say it, it's a, a bill that has the support of uh, uh, every sports organization such as the NCAA, Major League Baseball, the NFL, NHL, uh, as well as a broad scope of Christian groups from the Christian Coalition uh, to other religious groups, but including uh, major church and other uh, institutions in our society. Uh, it's also supported by 48 of the 50 states' attorney general. And so it does have a, a, a spectrum of support that is very impressive. And I, I think fits the kind of concerns that those that think your bill isn't comprehensive enough might look at. Uh, the second uh, bill I'm putting on the table is one I, I'm, I'm doing as a philosophical statement, recognizing that it's not the, the circumstance that many people are prepared to deal with, but I feel as an individual obligated to raise it. Uh, and that is that uh, I think that if you really think through the problems of this Congress, they relate to money and politics. Uh, and so how campaigns run is, is a very central thing. And so I have an approach that I've uh, long advocated, and I put it in an amendment form for this bill that uh, happens to be one that takes the larger money out of the out of the political system and says that campaigns should be run on small contributions that will be matched up to a given point. And if some uh, a, a person can choose to opt out of that system, if they do, uh, the person that doesn't opt out will have the right to have larger matching uh, circumstances. In any regard, uh, it's a very defined approach that uh, uh, is before you. And I would urge that these are outside the scope of your other considerations, but especially the first one might fit. Thank well, you. thank you uh, very much, Mr. Leach. Appreciate your very thoughtful uh, approach, and, and thank you for uh, taking the time to be here to focus on um, these issues that are very important to you. I appreciate it very much. Mr. diaz Ballard. I simply want to thank Mr. Leach for his hard work in coming before us today. Thank you. Mr. Slaughter. Mr. Leach, I thank you, too. You're a very thoughtful member and, and always put a lot of yourself into your bills and your minutes. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Mr. Slaughter. Mr. Hastings. Mr. Sessions. Mr. Putnam. Mr. Capito. Mr. Cole. Thank you, sir. Mr. Bishop. Thank you very much for being here, Jim. Um, let's go back to the uh, two members of the Judiciary Committee, Mr. Meehan and Mr. Van Hollen. Please uh, come forward. Mr. Van Hollen's not here any longer. Is he uh, left? Okay. Uh, Mr. Meehan, please. Uh, Come forward and uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Ranking member. Did you want to you want to be joined by Mr. Manuel? Uh, yeah, actually, we have. Uh, oh, okay. We well, have please. Joint, we have That's a couple fine. of amendments that we're offering. That's fine. Completely. Terrific. Come on forward. We're glad to have you. Thank you very thank much. You. Please proceed. 
Um, first of all, Mr. Chairman, I thank you for uh, reaching out uh, to me personally. I appreciated our conversations. Um, this is part of a process. I'm here to urge um, a couple of amendments. One is uh, the bill that uh, you had indicated that you looked at that both uh, Congressman Emanuel and I uh, had filed. Uh, we have two amendments. One is a revolving door amendment, and the other one is a lobbying context disclosure uh, amendment. There have been a, many lobbying disclosure amendments uh, that have been proposed, and obviously members of the committee have heard a lot of the uh, details of those. Uh, but uh, we feel that the revolving uh, door between members of uh, uh, Congress and lobbying firms uh, has to be closed. We double the uh, amount of time from one to two years, and we think it's long overdue that uh, that this bill uh, or this amendment uh, be uh, ruled in order. I've heard a lot of discussion um, during the course of the day and would urge as much as possible an open rule. It's been difficult, Mr. Chairman, to determine what's in the bill that's being proposed and what isn't. One day, we uh, dealt with this bill on the Judiciary Committee. There have been changes made since we had our markup in the Judiciary Committee one day. Uh, 527 groups are in the uh, bill the next. Uh, they're out, and apparently they're back in now. The Judiciary Committee passed uh, enhanced lobbying disclosures one day, and then it appears, at least, uh, that they have been stripped from the, uh, from the committee. Um, I also have a series of uh, amendments that uh, I have proposed with uh, Congressman Shays. I think he's done pretty much an analysis of, uh, of those. I do want to comment on the Office of Public integrity. Um, there's been a lot of discussion about the Ethics Committee. Uh, they've been deadlocked uh, here in the Congress and has been ineffective in terms of dealing with a host of investigations, including the Jack Abramoff uh, situation. I want to point out that the Office of Public Integrity proposal would be a nonpartisan office similar to the Office of Compliance. The office would be comprised of professional staff who would investigate only non-frivolous complaints of potential ethics violations and present its finding to the Ethics Committee for adjudication. I've heard time and time again from members on both sides of the aisle that this is some kind of an independent prosecutor, that it, that it takes away authority from the, uh, from the Ethics Committee. It does not. The Ethics Committee uh, would vote and could vote to stop an investigation at, at several uh, phases of an investigation, and the rules would be interpreted by the Ethics uh, Committee. So I just wanted to clarify uh, that point. Also on the lobbying reform, grassroots lobbying reform, I believe lobbying reform must include increased disclosure requirements for grassroots lobbying. The current Lobbying Disclosure Act requires disclosure of lobbying activities that involve direct contact with Congress, but there's no disclosure requirement for pro professional grassroots lobbying firms that are retrained to spend money on media campaigns to support or oppose legislation. When I talk about a grassroots lobbying firm, I'm not talking about grassroots organizations that mobilize their membership and petition uh, the government. I'm speaking of the professional firms like those set up by Jack Abramoff and Michael uh, uh, Scanlon that cheat, for example, Indian tribes out of millions of dollars. These professional grassroots firms are designed really specifically to avoid uh, lobbying disclosure. Uh, paid advertising, phone banks, uh, other types of efforts um, that, that are really designed to influence public policy uh, are now as widespread as direct lobbying themselves. And the public deserves the same level of transparency for both types of lobbying. Uh, a professional grassroots lobbying firm that receives or spends $25,000 or more per quarter, that's per quarter on grassroots lobbying activities, would have to disclose for each client the estimated total amount it receives from a client for grassroots lobbying aimed at the public, and secondly, an estimate of how much that total is spent on paid advertising. The amendment would not impair or restrict grassroots lobbying on any organization. It does not limit the amount of any group can spend for lobbying efforts. The provision does not require an organization to disclose its membership list, to disclose any communications with its members. So uh, the hour is late. That's a quick synopsis, but I thank uh, members of the committee for this opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Mann. would you like to go now? I'll, just be, I'll be real quick, especially on the issue of revolving door. Uh, Mr. Chairman, there are over 270 former members who are now registered lobbyists. The registered lobbyists of former members is bigger than either caucus in the House of Representatives. You have a one-year extension that exists on the law on the book. 
a proper time is two years at a minimum, both for the legislative and executive branch. If you look at the issues and investigations that are in the news as it relates to the legislative branch and executive branch, a two-year moratorium before you come back to lobbying would be highly recommended for bringing back the integrity. Again, former members of registered lobbies is bigger than either the Republican caucus or the Democratic caucus. I'd like to echo something else that Congressman Shea said in the sense of how angry he was with what happened to the Republican Congress. In 1994, the Republican Revolution came to change Washington. After the last year, I would say that Washington changed the Republican Congress more than the Republican Party changed what happens in Washington. And what passes for business as usual is not acceptable to the American people, and I don't believe it's acceptable to your caucus and what's happened. Now, you can sit here and we can all say both parties have problems. The truth is we have an institutional problem that requires an institutional solution. And the way we've approached this legislation is to par partisanize it and politicize it rather than open up the doors and have a full debate. <coughs> I would hope you to give, whether you accept these amendments, which I have hold little hope for because I'm used to this at this point, but I would hope on this issue that deals with the, how we do the people's business, this would be the one place that would be partisan free. Marty Meehan and I introduced our legislation with Senator Feingold back in May of 2005. The majority leader at that time, Tom DeLay, said there would be no way we'd ever do this, including Speaker Haster. When you look at what the bill is that you've introduced, you've at least kept your commitment. Well, thank you both very much. Uh, I have a question. Uh, Mr. Emanuel, were, were you uh, an advisor to President Clinton uh, during those last days of his administration? No. When he I left you, in October 28, 1998. And what okay. he did, Mr. Chairman, was wrong. All right, so you were not involved in his Mr. Chairman, decision to uh, revoke I was not the there executive and I, order and what he that did was barred wrong. Yes, that barred uh, lobbying by administration officials for five years. You were, you, you were not there. I was not there. Right. I state, state my principle, but I appreciate you bringing that Thank up. Thank you both very much. Mr. Putnam. Uh, Mrs. Slaughter. No questions. Uh, Mrs. Capito. Uh, yes. And uh, Mr. Bishop. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to have I haven't been able to offer this. I'm getting seniority, but I don't have that much. You just started a Senate race. There are some legislative bodies that have something similar. Um, yeah. It's basically a way to professionalize the staff yeah. to conduct investigation, but again, well, we took a number of ideas. There are some legislative bodies that do have similar type systems. Not exactly the same, but. Well, Massachusetts, uh, New York, I mean, there were a number of different ideas about it. Uh, but the, so Florida. Nebraska. I mean, it's not something that, look, there are a lot of states that, uh, that have similar type procedures. This is not an independent council, by the way. I, if the, I, I assume, pardon me? Yes. And ideas from various uh, groups that have been involved in reform. Mrs. Matsui. Thank you both very much. Thanks. Thank you. That's Mr. Heffley, if you'd like to uh, testify at this point. And uh, Mr. Doggett, you might want to come up. For the sake of. Uh, <laughs> uh, of course, you may. You may. Shadi, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, uh, though he is not here, I would like to compliment the chairman of the full committee, Mr. Dreyer for his uh, very, very long and arduous work on this bill. I think it's important. I think it's important legislation. I think it's important to send a message uh, to America that we are doing what Mr. Shea said, which is trying to clean up our own act, trying to police our own members, trying to make sure that we are doing uh, the best we can to assure that the people's work is done uh, above board and honestly and in the open and with sunshine uh, so that they can have absolute confidence in it. We are in no small measure here, Mr. Chairman, because of the conduct of Jack Abramoff and Michael Scanlon. 
My amendment goes right at the heart of the most egregious abuse they engaged in. Uh, fundamentally, they abused both a situation having to do with municipalities that do not report lobbying activities, but they also, as was mentioned here earlier, victimized many American Indian tribes. They victimized them by charging them outrageous fees. Uh, and as we all know, the structure was that Mr. Abramoff would charge a very high lobbying fee, but there are limits on that, and so he would work a backhanded deal where he would get them to hire Mr. Scanlon, who would then pay a much more egregiously high uh, public relations fee, of which he got a kickback. A number of my friends in Arizona looked at this situation. We have a number of tribes in Arizona. And they said, look, quite frankly, this would not have happened with regard to a corporately owned casino because the casino would have had to have put into its annual filings how much it was spending on lobbying fees and how much it was spending on public relations fees. And the stockholders would have looked at those outrageously high fees and said, what are you doing? Paying these unbelievable, egregious fees to a lobbyist or to a public relations agent, and what are you getting for it? Because, as we all know, at the heart of the issue was, what were they getting from Mr. Abramoff or Mr. Scanlon? And sadly, we know they were getting little to nothing. What my bill says is recognizing that those Indian tribes were, in fact, victimized by Mr. Abramoff and Mr. Scanlon. They were, in part, victimized by the structure of IGRA which does not require the Indian tribes to reveal, even to their own members, the expenditures that they are making of casino proceeds. All the bill says is not that they would have to disclose that information to the public, but rather that any operator of a Native American casino would be required once annually to report to the members of their own tribe the amount of money they are spending on lobbying and the amount of money they are spending on public relations. This would put them really not even in the same position as a, a corporation running such a casino because that corporation has to disclose this information publicly. I thought it was more important just to have it disclosed to members of the tribe. I believe this is a sunshine provision. I believe it would inform members of the tribe. It would not allow this kind of egregious conduct to go on before. And it seems to me that if we are here dealing with abuses by lobbyists and if we are here dealing with uh, a set of circumstances that were brought about by the egregious conduct of Mr. Abramoff and Mr. Scanlon, we ought to go directly at their conduct. I believe sunshine is the right way to go. Uh, I believe that uh, individual members of the tribe, if they have this information, will act upon it appropriately, and these kind of abuses could not occur again in the future. It's a simple, straightforward amendment. Once a year, the operator of the casino would report to its tribal members, and only its tribal members, the amount being spent on uh, lobbyist fees and public relations fees, and those terms are defined not to include their routine advertising to get customers into their casinos. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions, uh, Mr. Chairman. Well, you've been very clear, very clear, and appreciate you uh, coming before us uh, very much. Uh, uh, Mr. Putnam? No Ms. Ms. Matsui? Yes. Ms. Capito? Bishop? I'm sorry, I do, and I'm trying to look at it very quickly here. Uh, they would be disclosing to their members of the tribe. Do you specify in what manner that would take place? How that would be? An annual written disclosure of the amount spent on those uh, on uh, lobbying and public relations with a specific declaration or, or clarification that that does not include their advertising to get business. It would be public relations of the type that Mr. Scanlon was supposed to be engaged in. And this would. This, it would mandate that they send it to them? Just to the members of the tribe, so that members of the tribe would be aware of what money is being spent. In any particular way? Or just... I mean, I'm prescribed just, I'm just... by, by uh, certified mail? No, we do not go to that level of detail. I'm just wondering the mechanism of how that uh, message would I, I, get out. I would leave that to, I presume, the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shattuck. I, I would also thank Mr. Hefley so that he enabled me to make my vote. Thanks very much. Mr. Doggett. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and members. Uh, if Sunshine is one of the major answers to the problems that we face in Congress with lobbying today, as Mr. Shattuck just testified, as uh, Mr. Dreyer has indicated with the very title of his legislation and has been repeatedly indicated by our colleagues, then I guess you could say that I'm here to prevent the eclipse. Uh, I am here on the same uh, matter that I addressed this committee on previously during its general hearing on lobbying. It is a narrow concern and yet a very broad one. 
because all that a lobbyist needs to do to circumvent the existing disclosure laws is to, instead of representing an individual company or an individual, is to decide that they're representing a coalition, a council, an alliance, or a committee. And once they do that, uh, that is the client that they make their report on, and you never find out who the real party in interest on lobbying is. Uh, this is not an academic concern. I've had the Congressional Research Service uh, investigate this matter over a period of a number of years. Uh, in the last decade, there have been 791 of these coalitions, councils, and alliances. And for over half of them, there is absolutely no membership information uh, on file with the clerk's office in the lobby disclosure forms. If you do some detective work, combing through newspaper articles, the internet, and so forth, as I've asked the Congressional Search Service to do, you can find the membership list uh, for about one in five of these coalitions, and you can find part of the, the membership for maybe an additional one in four. But for the majority of these coalitions, uh, it's a mystery. Indeed, it's a mystery why more lobbyists uh, don't use this giant loophole in our existing disclosure laws. And all that I propose to do in the amendment that I ask the committee to give uh, our colleagues a chance to vote on uh, is to close that loophole once and for all. Uh, an example of how that loophole has been abused and misused in the past uh, made the front page of the New York Times a few years ago was something called the Section 877 Coalition. It was a, uh, it turned out, uh, after some investigation, uh, that it was a small group of wealthy individuals uh, who liked the idea of renouncing United States citizenship in order to avoid taxes. But finding out who that coalition was was impossible uh, through the normal lobby disclosure mechanism. Same thing is true of the Council for Energy Independence, which sounds like a great cause we're all for. It's just that this council doesn't lobby for energy independence. It spent $2.5 million to preserve $9 billion in tax credits, credits that even their supporters indicate for sin fuels generate no new energy sources and no more efficient or environmentally uh, beneficial energy. Uh, this amendment would put a stop to that. I am not interested in getting the membership of the Christian Coalition, the Sierra Club, or the National Rifle Association, and there's a specific exemption in the amendment to assure we're not going into the membership list, but do seek to provide the kind of disclosure and sunlight without an eclipse that so many members on both sides of the aisle have said that they're for, and I would urge the committee to permit consideration of this amendment. Thank you very much, Mr. Doggett. Any questions for Mr. Doggett, Mr. Capito, Ms. Slaughter? No questions. Mr. Bishop, Mr. Matsui. Um, <clears throat> so these are coalitions or that or councils for one particular issue that they may want to be pushing and they may not, they want to maybe hide the membership of the people behind. Yes, you know uh, uh, that normally when a lobbyist comes to see us, they're very pleased for us to know who they're representing, right. especially if it's somebody from our district or someone that perhaps has substantial influence in our district or creates jobs there. Of course, under the coalition concept, you can have the best of both worlds. In the individual meeting, they can tell you why it is so important to your district, but to the public at large, to the press, if it's a particularly unpopular cause, like defending the rights of those who renounce their citizenship in order to avoid the paying their fair share of taxes, they can hide that. And it, uh, there are many uh, councils and alliances and coalitions that are perfectly legitimate, that disclose fully their membership, but there are a substantial number that are using this loophole to dodge the lobby disclosure requirements. So is there an increase in those numbers of people uh, in, in the organizations are using the loophole? Well, over I, I, I haven't looked at it year to year, uh -huh. but over the last decade, uh, almost 800 uh, these coalitions have been, have been uh, formed. Or some of them are called councils or alliances, and uh, well over half of them we cannot get any membership information on. Okay. And I don't think they have any particular <laughs> philosophical or uh, party alignment. They're just a device that a lobbyist with an unpopular cause can use to hide the true parties that are here lobbying from so the So they public. might have some benign type of organizational title or something like that. Well, it's usually title. it's entirely benign, like the Council <laughs> for uh, Energy Independence. Uh, you could have the Council on Good or Coalition on Good Deeds or Good Government. They're much like the names of some of the PACs that we are so familiar with that all sound uh, to be worthy and supportive of democracy, and many of them are, 
But if they're doing, if they have such a good cause, why hide from the public and from uh, all who might want to know about their endeavors who the true party and interest are and, and who's really up here lobbying? Okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. Doggett. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Doggett. Appreciate thank your you. uh, coming before us. Uh, Mr. Heffley, welcome. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman and members, and uh, uh, for letting me have the opportunity to do this. Um, we have a, a bill, which is a, um, an ethics um, process reform bill. Um, and we have made it into an amendment for this bill because we think they fit hand in glove and uh, would ask your consideration of it. And I, I worked on this uh, with uh, Mr. Holzoff, uh, Mr. La Tourette, Mr. Shays, and others. But um, uh, particularly Mr. Holzoff and Mr. La Tourette were colleagues with me on the Ethics Committee. And I served on the Ethics Committee for for eight years, and don't ask me why anyone would subject themselves to that for eight years, and was chairman of it for, for four years. And there were some things in the process that we saw that we thought could make that process work better. Now, we touch a little bit on lobbyists and reporting and so forth, but mainly it's the, the ethics uh, enforcement process. This amendment is, um, I think, the only one that has extensive bipartisan support. Uh, connected with this whole ethics thing. Um, it is, um, and not only bipartisan support, but um, philosophical support from the various extremes. We have some of the most liberal members of the House on it, some of the most conservative. We have uh, both in Democrat and Republican Party. So it's not, a, it's not tied to philosophical things. It's not tied to party. It's tied to just trying to make the process uh, work better. Uh, we don't think it replaces or diminishes the underlying bill at all. We think it adds to it. And it has broad and sweeping disclosure across the board. All gifts over $20 be disclosed. All privately funded travel disclosed. All lobbyist registrations disclosed. All passengers on corporate jets, dis jets disclosed. And all members' financial disclosure statements. All of them put on the Internet and all of it in, in real time. Uh, yet it allows uh, members to continue private travel. I, uh, I think private travel is important. Abuse of private travel is not important, and we ought to crack down on abuse of private travel. Uh, but, uh, for instance, I'm, I'm invited to speak at a, um, at a college graduation, uh, as many of us get invited to do these kind of things, about 300 miles away from my home. And um, if, if the underlying bill passes, then if I do that, I pay for it myself. I, I think if they want me to come do it, they ought to pay for it. Uh, and I go there, and I fly in one night. I do the speech the next day, and I fly out. I mean, it's no big deal. That's not an abuse. And I don't think we ought to end that. I think uh, there, are, there are reasons for some private travel. So we allow that, uh, but we, we have it uh, cleared first by the, uh, by the Ethics Committee. The amendment also uh, strengthens um, enforcement of our ethics rules uh, by, as I said, strengthening the Ethics Committee. And, you know, the Ethics Committee, there's some talk that we've got to have a special counsel um, and uh, or a special office of compliance or something. And there, there are a number of states, particularly Florida and Nebraska, and, of course, England does that kind of thing. But I think we have proven that the Ethics Committee can work and work very well. Uh, we never, when I was chairman of it, and um, Mr. Mollahan and Mr. Berman were ranking members on it, we never had a partisan vote on the Ethics Committee. We never deadlocked. We never came close to deadlocking. Uh, so I think we proved that, uh, that it can work, and we handled many, many cases, more cases than have been handled by the Ethics Committee uh, in this, that length of time uh, in history. So I think we proved that the present system can work with the proper uh, safeguards. Um, so one, one of the things we do is give the committee broader subpoena power during the informal phase of the investigation so that you, you have uh, better evidence of whether you ought to uh, proceed with an investigation and, an, and create an investigative subcommittee or whether you ought to um, dismiss the case. Uh, you know, if, if someone's not guilty, we want to get it off their backs fast. In our business, that's very important. And this would allow us to do that. We strengthen the, the independence of the chair and the ranking member. We strengthen the independence of the staff by recognizing that that's a professional staff. That's not a political staff. It's a professional staff. And they should not be 
not come and go at the whims of whoever happens to be the chairman and ranking member. <clears throat> and uh, so we do that. We also uh, uh, have provisions um, I, that, again, I think under, that complements the underlying legislation because we increase transparency, we increase oversight, um, we give the Ethics Committee authority to aggressively investigate potential violations whenever those are necessary. And then it uh, contains several other provisions which I think strengthen the integrity of the committee and of the process. Remember, the Ethics Committee is a committee not for the Republican Party, not for the Democratic Party. It's a committee for the institution of Congress. That's the only reason we serve on it. It's not a fundraising committee. It's not a committee where I get a lot of votes when I was on it. Uh, it's for the institution itself. So <clears throat> we require in this bill mandatory ethics training, not only for the staff, but for the, uh, but for the members. And I know you can't make members do anything, but, um, but it is put on the internet whether you did it or not. So let that be a, an influence for you to go get your ethics training. It um, establishes the requirement that there be an ethics officer in each office uh, so that there is someone paying attention to this all the time. Um, we increase the due process rights for those who are accused. One of the things that I regret when I was chairman was that there, um, Candace Miller got caught up in an investigation uh, not knowing she was involved in it at all, and we didn't know she was involved in it at all. Um, and there was a, an admonition uh, of Candace Miller, uh, and it caught her by surprise. The first she knew about it is when it came out publicly, and that was wrong, and we shouldn't have that. There should be a due process so that they can uh, defend themselves prior to it becoming public. Um, and, um, and as I said earlier, the uh, Ethics Committee would pre-certify and pre-screen uh, private travel <clears throat> so that you have a letter in your hand, they've examined it, they say no, in accordance with what you, the information you've presented us, this is a legal, legitimate private travel and your, your agenda is legitimate. And, um, and then if anyone criticizes it, they've got that pre-approval by the Ethics Committee. But basically, Mr. Chairman and members, that's what it does. And I think it strengthens the underlying bill. And if we're going to deal with reform here, I think we ought to broaden the reform. It's not just lobbyists. We ought to broaden the reform. Thank you, Mr. Heffley. It's evident that you've put in a tremendous amount of work and thought into this. And so uh, I thank you. Thank you for bringing it to our attention. Uh, Mr. Capito, questions? Ms. Slaughter? Yes, I just want to say to Mr. Heffley, I appreciate you bringing that amendment here. Uh, you served the Ethics Committee with great distinction for those years. For that, we thank you. Uh, and I, I, for whoever decides what amendments are in order, I hope they give you every consideration. You mean you're not the one? That... I'm not. Oh. Well, thank Mr. you very much. Mr. Bishop? Ms. Matsui? Um, I want to thank you very much. I think they're very thoughtful. Um, it's a thoughtful amendment. I think it's it's quite clear that you understand uh, the ethics process and through your valued experience. I think it's really important that we look at this amendment. I I certainly support it, and I hope we can make an order. Thank you. Thank you, Joel. Thank you very much. I would ask Mr. Sherman to come on up. Welcome, and Mr. Castle. Maybe form a little form a duo there. Mr. Sherman, you're welcome. My amendment and uh, remarks are both brief and nonpartisan. Most of the bill provides new standards. But the reason we're here today more than anything else is Cunningham. He violated all the old standards. What we need is better enforcement of the standards we do have. Uh, in particular, Cunningham had a phony sale of his home, and he had a lifestyle out of sync with his legitimate income. The core of true enforcement is the personal financial disclosure statement that we will all be filing next month. That personal financial disclosure statement can cannot be an effective check on the future Cunninghams for a few reasons. First, there's a particular rule that you don't disclose transactions involving your home. It seems odd to continue that rule when it was the home sale that was at the very core 
of Cunningham's uh, outrageous behavior. Second, the personal financial disclosure statement does not have the, process, the, the two keys that the IRS relies on to deal with the personal financial disclosure statement that every American files on April 15th and to assure its accuracy. The first thing that the IRS does is provide for random audits. The second thing the IRS does on occasion is compare reported income to the lifestyle of the person filing the report. Neither of these two things was involved or faced Mr. Cunningham when he decided that he could get away with murder year after year after year. Uh, we have no system for auditing these personal financial disclosure statements, and no one is asking the Cunninghams of the future, how is it that you're living at this lifestyle when you're reporting a much lower income? What my amendment would do is first say that transactions involving your personal residence should be disclosed just along with all the other major transactions that you're disclosing. Cunningham proved that the personal residence can be uh, a source of corruption just as much as a stock portfolio. Second, it says that the uh, Inspector General of the House will do random audits. And finally, it, asks, it uh, empowers the Inspector General to simply ask, what is your lifestyle and how does that compare to uh, the income that you're reporting? In the absence of this amendment, our uh, personal financial disclosure statements will uh, not lead uh, to any effective enforcement by the House of its ethics. We should point out that Cunningham was not caught by the Inspector General. He was not caught by the House of Representatives. He was caught by the neighbors who live close to the house that he sold at a wildly inflated price. So uh, it's about time that we catch the bad apples through enforcement by the House of Representatives and not rely on the people that live across the street from us, uh, wherever me, we may happen to live. Uh, that's, my, that's my remarks. I'm Appreciate very much. The questions. Thanks for coming before us. Mr. Capito. I have a Slaughter. Powerful amendment, and I support you. Mr. Bishop, Ms. Matsui, thank you very much. Thanks for coming before us. Mr. Castle, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You've been here a long time. I hope you listened to what Mr. Hepley had to say. In fact, yes. I think I like his amendment more than I like my own amendment, so I'm about to. <laughs> but uh, I'm going to be trying to be quick. I know, you, I know you have been here a while, and I do have six amendments, but they're probably duplicative of other things you've seen. Basically, I believe in transparency and education in this process. And there are times when I say, do we really need all this? If you have larceny in your heart, you're going to do it anyhow. Uh, but on the other hand, I think with some education, et cetera, uh, perhaps we can avoid some of these things. But my First Amendment uh, basically would create an independent body to do the investigation side of the claim of unethical, unethical or illegal actions by members or their staffs. Uh, and this could be, I, in my legislation, it's members of Congress who've been out for five years and don't lobby and former judges, although it could be anybody. The reason for this is, this committee simply did not function for the last 15 or 16 months. And I think if you go to the outside, uh, you wouldn't have that problem. And I'm not getting into the whys and wherefores of why it didn't function, uh, but it did not. And I think that, uh, that does not reflect well upon us. Uh, my, my second and, and third amendments are, are similar. Uh, the first would extend ethics trading to not only staff, but also to members. And another amendment that requires the same education uh, for registered lobbyists. As a matter of fact, we're going to have somebody from uh, the, the committee come up and talk to us about ethics in, in our office. I think the members have to be involved in this, and I think the lobbyists need to be a lot more involved in this as well in terms of understanding uh, what is going on out there and what the potential penalties could, could be. Uh, the Fourth Amendment I have uh, is that we would pay the same rate uh, that a constituent would pay for a, for a flight, which, of course, is the full cost of the flight. Uh, I think it's, I think it's uh, not proper that we do not uh, do that in, in the case of uh, uh, flights on corporately owned jets, for example. Uh, and also, uh, I have an amendment that a lobbyist who knowingly offers a gift in violation of the gift ban would be a sub subject to a civil fine of up to $50,000, 50000 reserved for the very special people who uh, perhaps go way too far. Uh, but I think the lobbyists do need to be brought into the jurisdiction of this. Uh, and finally, I have an amendment for consideration for the committee that would extend the time uh, that members or staff could lobby from one year to one year or the remainder of that Congress uh, whichever is longer, and I include all staff and not, not senior staff. may not be that popular in this room, but uh, I believe uh, that is something else we, we should be doing. I th I've, I've been in and out of this room 
most of the afternoon. I've heard a lot of very, very good amendments, and I hope uh, truly this committee will consider not just the underlying bill, but, but some of these amendments, including my own. So, as always, uh, you're very, very thoughtful. Appreciate your uh, hard work and coming before us. Thanks very much. Uh, any questions, Mr. Capito? Uh, when you just mentioned uh, other members, all members of the staff, is would your amendment have the effect of is a, if a staff assistant left your office and went to work for Medtronics, that that would not be allowed for another year? Well, I, you know, to, to tell you the truth, I don't remember the exact language, so I don't want to say the exact yeah. exactly what it is. But it, but if that person left and went to work for Medtronics, that person could not lobby Congress. I'm not saying Medtronics couldn't lobby Congress, no. but that person could not lobby Congress for the duration of uh, either one year or until that, if that Congress has been in, is going to be in session for more than a year until the next term of Congress. Okay, thank you. Ms. Lahr. Um, Mr. Pass, for very thoughtful amendments, and I, I'm really intrigued by the uh, number 35, uh, about the independent body, because we've talked about that a lot, uh, as to whether it's just too difficult for members of Congress to judge their colleagues. Uh, and uh, I, I, I think the day will come when we'll probably do this, either the retired judges. You, you recommend former members. I know. Well, I do recommend former members because they have some sense of it. Uh, people have not lobbied. Uh, mm -hmm. Obviously, you know, if you read it carefully, it's picked by the minority and by the majority in a balanced situation. Right. Or, or judges, people who have some background, that kind of thing. I remember sitting right in this room back from my first or second term in Congress with uh, Bob Livingston had a committee to look at the Ethics Committee. Mm -hmm. And I frankly rejected that idea at that time. I thought it was better to do it uh, in-house. Mm -hmm. uh, and it really, I was driven to it by the inaction of this year. I just think, the, I just think it's absurd. And I, I think it is hard for us to judge each other. It is. I wouldn't and, want and, to judge anyone. And I, I think a lot of us abandoned it about the same time when we thought there seemed to be a sense that, that it was our obligation, that it happened on our watch, and that we should, we should take care of it. Uh, but I, I don't think that's going to work anymore. I, I'm not. I, maybe it will. I don't know. That's my view. Um, but what about the only question I'd have is the former members who have been gone for five years. What can they have been doing in that time that would not destroy their eligibility to? Well, I mean, that, that you're right. I mean, it, it would probably be a fairly small pool. I guess there was a time when former members didn't lobby. I, most former members do lobby now yeah, or stay in Washington. Pretty much. And, and frankly, you have a logistical problem of how close are they physically. So if they're in Washington, they may have been lobbying. Uh, but it, it is, I mean, there are people who've, uh, you know, who've left here and just simply have gone into something else. They've taught or become a farmer or whatever it may be, and, and uh, we, would, we would pick from those ranks. I mean, if you look back, there's, there's a lot of members who have left over a period of time. And obviously, if that's a problem, I'm more than willing to it. It would have to be spelled out, I think, in the amendment what the credentials would be. Thank you very much for your amendments. Bishop. Uh, Ms. Matchley. Thank you very much, Mr. Castle. I, I, I'm looking at all these amendments, and they're certainly very good amendments, and I think any one of these will make the underlying bill better. I, 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 a lot of this is on ethics training, and I think that's really very important. I think uh, mandated ethics training for everybody is really important because, unfortunately, I think that's just sort of, uh, in a way, gets left off. But obviously, <laughs> we should do that. And I think if it's something like this that's required, and people know, and also the lobbyists, too, I think. That has to be included too, uh, but I just think they're very thoughtful amendments, and I hope, I hope the majority of these be, could be made in order. I mean, obviously, I agree because I presented the amendment, but I couldn't agree with you more. I, I, I just feel of all the things perhaps we can do around here, the the mandatory ethics training uh, of everybody, uh, of every staff person, of every member, of every lobbyist, so everyone knows what these rules are. So when you look at somebody someplace, you know that they're violating the rule. They know they're violating the rule. My judgment is there'll be less violation of rules. I just believe in that very, very strongly. It's just too much of sort of burying your head in the sand. Later. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. I would ask uh, Mrs. Bordallo if she would like to testify at this point. Mr. Kirk. <coughs> Mrs. Bordallo, welcome. Your statement has already been the right. Without objection, it will be printed its entirety in its entirety in the record. So you're, yeah, you're welcome to summarize if you if you may. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman and ranking member and members of the committee. Um, the Berdalio Jones Amendment is straightforward. Its purpose is to strengthen current law by making the practice of third-party lobbying activities more transparent. It would require registrants who are retained to engage in lobbying activities on behalf of a party or an entity other than their direct client to disclose that fact. 
in good faith and to the best of their knowledge on their financial disclosure reports filed with the Clerk of the House and the Secretary of the Senate. The identity of the contact information for, and most importantly, the amounts paid by a third party for the registrant's services is the information that this amendment proposes to be required for disclosure on a quarterly basis as part of a financial disclosure report filed by lobbyists. Section 4 of the Lobbying Disclosure Act of 1995 currently requires a lobbyist to list on their initial registration form the name, the address, and the principal place of business of any organization other than their client that contributes more than $10,000 toward the registrant's lobbying activities in a semi-annual period, or who in whole or in major part plans, supervisors, or controls such lobbying activities. However, the current disclosure process goes no further with respect to a third contractual relationship between a lobbyist and a client. Disclosure of the amounts received under such an arrangement is not currently required. In my district, Mr. Chairman, we are aware of instance where some lobbying contracts had been arranged to involve third parties and pass through financing to conceal the identity of a client. The changes to the Lobbying Disclosure Act proposed are complementary and would reinforce the existing Section 4 disclosure provisions. The authors of the Lobbying Disclosure Act understood that accurate reporting of the identity of participants in third party lobbying activities is important for transparency. In fact, the Committee on the Judiciary expressed its views on the registration form requirement enacted into law as part of the 95 Act. They described this section of current law as, quote, intended to preclude evasion of the disclosure requirements of the Act through the creation of ad hoc lobbying coalitions behind which real parties <coughs> in interest can hide, end of quote. I believe that reports required by the Act should capture to the greatest extent possible the contractual lobbying relationships entered into by registrants and their clients. In closing, while current law requires that registrants declare third-party contractual lobbying relationships on their registration reports, the law does not specifically require the disclosure of the important details of the third-party contractual lobbying activities. And this amendment would close this loophole. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming before us, bring, uh, bringing us your uh, well thought through idea. Ms. Capitol? Yes. Slaughter? Thank you. Bishop? Matsui? Thank, Thank you so much. Thanks for coming before us. Ms. Kirk, welcome. Thanks for waiting. Inseremos contra los comunistas and. Oh, sir. I'm giving that speech. You know how to make, be made in order. <laughs> Uh, I'm coming to uh, present uh, uh, an amendment which I've talked about several times before before this committee when we've considered uh, the issue of um, felonies committed by members of Congress. This is the uh, Kirk Cooper Platts Amendment, but we'll have a very large year calling going out uh, later on tonight. We're working with a lot of outside groups uh, uh, on this. Uh, in the history of the Congress, about 11,000 people have served in the Congress. Uh, in the last 50 years, about 16 members uh, have gone to indictment, trial, uh, a conviction by a jury of their peers, and lost all their appeals. So in the grand sweep of things, uh, out of, uh, out of uh, a very large number of individuals, we are not seeing a crime wave in the Congress. Uh, but conviction and final adjudication in a felony is a rare event in the Congress and must be treated very severely. <laughs> I think that's why the speaker wanted in the uh, underlying bill to uh, deny a pension for a member of Congress convicted of a felony. Uh, it conforms with the state of Illinois law, not a place known for its uh, ethics and good government. I, I think we're on our way to sending our fourth governor to, uh, to, to jail there and a continuing crusade to clean up our state government. Here, I think we need to uh, set a higher standard and this amendment is based on legislation which overwhelmingly passed the Congress as part of the Republican Revolution in 1996. The vote on the, the text of this amendment was 391 to 32, uh, with the Speaker and the Minority Leader uh, all voting for it. Uh, what this did was uh, set up a, a list of other felonies 
uh, which would jeopardize upon conviction and final adjudication of a felony for a member of Congress. The underlying bill before the committee has only three felonies identified, bribery, conspiracy, and acting as a foreign agent. But as part of the Republican revolution, the legislation that we passed on an overwhelmingly bipartisan basis, and as part of our political reforming heritage here, identified a number of other felonies. The felonies currently left off the current version of the bill, which were in the original Republican Revolution bill, include uh, making fraudulent claims against the taxpayer, uh, using money to influence voting, promising appointments by a candidate, uh, intimidation to secure uh, political contributions, wire fraud, suborning a juror, uh, and uh, income tax evasion. All of these things should be part of our final bill. Quite frankly, this on the floor would be a very good vote for a number of members to make and would urge that we uh, include this as one of the final. Thanks so much. Thanks Thank for coming before us. Any questions, Mr. Capitol? Slaughter. No uh, and Mrs. Metsui. Thanks so much. Thank Thanks, you. Mark. Uh, and I want to thank uh, Ms. Bean and Mr. Van Holden for being so uh, patient. If they would come forth, both of you, please. We have no energy yet. Good morning. Oh, okay. But in terms of the witnesses, <laughs> you have some too. I, I just have the substitute. Yeah. Can I just insert you? Well, let's let them talk and do whatever you want. Yes, uh, Ms. Uh, Bean, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman uh, and members of the committee for allowing me to speak on my proposed amendment. The goal of my amendment is simple. It's to have every member's official and publicly funded website provide a direct link to their online voting records from a reorganized database maintained by the clerk. Mr. Chairman, congressional ethics concerns are on the minds of the American public. And I'm hoping the House can come together across partisan lines to shed more daylight on how we conduct business and take action to prevent abuses of the legislative process in the future. Democracy works best when the American electorate is engaged and informed. One of our most important responsibilities as representatives is to keep our constituents informed of how and why we make the decisions we do. It is my sincere hope that our chamber will have the opportunity to institute real changes that will provide the transparency that can and should be expected from the United States Congress. The bill we're now debating is called the Lobbying Accountability and Transparency Act. <coughs> Unfortunately, accountability and transparency are words we frequently use but rarely apply to ourselves. Toward that end, this amendment would move us one step closer to doing so by providing our constituents an easily accessible resource for tracking our votes. The House Clerk's website and the Library of Congress's Thomas site are valuable tools for civic participation, but constituents still find it difficult to find or understand their own representative's complete voting record. For instance, currently the clerk has votes organized by roll call number, but not by member. My amendment would require the House Clerk to also maintain complete voting records organized by member. This information would be linked directly to each of our publicly funded official websites so that our constituents can easily find out just how we voted. With the click of a button, anyone with access to the internet would be able to view a comprehensive list of every roll call vote cast by the representative <coughs> and see a description of each vote, the result, and if available, a CBO cost estimate. The resources are already in place. The House Clerk already maintains publicly available information regarding specific roll call votes. The CBO already makes available nonpartisan cost estimates of pending legislation. And Thomas already publishes the CRS summaries of bills. My amendment would just organize this information into a more user-friendly resource. The U.S. House of Representatives is supposed to be the most representative body of our government. One of the easiest ways this institution can regain the public's trust is by making it easier for citizens to be informed. This amendment can put real accountability and transparency into the Lobbying Accountability and Transparency Act. Mr. Chairman, with that in mind, I urge this committee to accept my amendment. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thanks for uh, bringing your uh, idea before us and for your uh, hard work. Uh, Ms. Capito. 
Ms. Slaughter? No questions, but thank you for the reporting. Mr. Bishop, no questions. Ms. Matsui? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bean. Thank you very much. Mr. Van, Ho Van Hollen, thank you very much for waiting. Oh, not at all. I thank you, um, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Slaughter, members of the committee. Uh, it's good to be here. I'm here to ask that you actually reinstate uh, and make an order an amendment that I offered in the Judiciary Committee that passed the Judiciary Committee, uh, but somehow amazingly just disappeared from the bill uh, with respect to the substitute as presented uh, before uh, this committee. And the amendment's very simple. Uh, it requires registered lobbyists uh, to disclose as part of their normal disclosure requirements under the lobbying disclosure rules uh, when they've solicited and transmitted a campaign contribution to a candidate. So the burden's placed on the lobbyist at the time uh, they make their report simply to report uh, campaign contributions that they've both solicited and uh, transmitted. It also requires that they disclose lobbyists, that is, uh, when they serve as campaign treasurers uh, or the chairman of political uh, committees to disclose that fact as well. Uh, I might say this amendment was added to the bill before the Judiciary Committee by a bipartisan vote of 28 to 4. Mr. Heffley referenced bipartisan efforts. This was a uh, bipartisan effort, and those of you know who the Judiciary Committee members are know that that represents a very wide uh, range of uh, viewpoints. Uh, let, me, let me just say, I mean, this goes to what I think is the, the guts of the issue. We keep hearing up here disclosure, disclosure. It's important for us to inform our voters and provide them the information with which to make uh, judgments and add a little sunshine, uh, as Justice Brandis uh, famously said, to add a little disinfectant to the process. Uh, and that's what this does. It says when a lobbyist goes out uh, and solicit funds, and I think one of the big missing pieces in this whole bill is the nexus between lobbying and fundraising. This bill doesn't really deal with fundraising at all, but I think that to the extent that we're dealing with the lobbyist uh, issue, we should at the very least get at the nexus between lobbying and the campaign uh, finance system. And that's exactly what this bill does. It simply requires uh, that reporting to take place. And I must say, it's ironic that uh, an editorial about this amendment that appeared in the Washington Post shortly after it was adopted by the Judiciary Committee stated, and, and I quote, uh, we are almost reluctant to flag this provision for fear that it will be shot down all the more quickly. But in fact, no other disclosure requirement would be more useful in explaining the way Washington does business than this one, end of quote. And I ask that we submit that editorial for the record now, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you look, yeah, obviously their prediction came true. I mean, I don't think they needed to flag it. I think members on the Judiciary Committee, when they had an opportunity to vote on it in the light of day when the public was watching, they voted for it because they knew it was the right thing to do with respect to their constituents back home. But it disappeared on the way to this committee. The bill that the committee has put forward doesn't have that provision that was adopted uh, 28 to 4 uh, by the Judiciary Committee. And frankly, that process is a big part of the problem trying to get out with this whole issue. I mean, I think the amendment uh, is essential for getting at the whole nexus, as I said, between lobbying and the campaign finance system, which I think erodes uh, the public confidence and faith uh, in the system. But the way this amendment disappeared on the way to the Rules Committee is another example of exactly the kind of problems uh, we're trying to get at. Because when people have to vote in the light of day, they vote one way, and now we have no accountability. Because look, it disappeared. Uh, and so now, uh, you know, the only people uh, that will have an opportunity to vote on this, if you don't make it in order, will be the members of the uh, Rules Committee. I think we should do uh, what we did in the, in the committee, uh, is allow all members of the, the House uh, to make an up or down vote uh, on this. And I hope that they will adopt the uh, recommendations of the Judiciary Committee made 28 to 4. Thank you, Mr. Van Hollen. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Capito. Yes, I have a question about the gentleman's amendment. When you say in there solicit or, what does it say, solicit or make, and. and. So let's, let's put it into practical terms. Um, how does this work if uh, a, a lobbyist for, well, I don't know, the restaurant association is, is going to make a contribution to your campaign, for instance? Um, does that mean any conversation that, well, we're going to send you a check, then that's written down, or is it when you receive? when they actually cut the check and send it to your campaign right. or no in because the, the solicit thing I'm thinking well it could, that right. that's just kind of but vague. both both conditions have to apply in other words it's not solicit or transmit it's solicit and transmit so if you're a lobbyist and you go and request uh, a contribution uh, from one of your clients 
and present that contribution or send that contribution, transmit that contribution uh, to a member of Congress. You have to report that contribution, just as today you have to report your own contributions as a matter of your law. So any time that a, I'm sorry, before I get you finish, I, any time that a lobbyist would would be asking another person for a contribution for a candidate, and, and, that, the, lo and the lobbyist transmits that. I'm, look, I think we. But even we if you ask like an individual, a, 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 a just a, if an the lobby, if, if it's their next door neighbor, say for instance. If a lobbyist goes to their next door neighbor and says, <laughs> "I'd like you to make a contribution," a lobbyist who represents whatever interest they're uh -huh. representing up here, I'd like you to make a, a contribution, to the congressman uh, Capito, and, uh -huh. and 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 I and I'm, I want to deliver it. Um, yes, I mean if they just ask for a contribution and someone uh, and it's not transmitted by the lobbyist, that would not be covered. There, it, both conditions have to apply. This is designed to get at, which is a, a, a widespread practice here in Washington. I don't think it's any secret to anybody, which is the bundling done by lobbyists. I mean, lobbyists represent a certain interest. They put together a fundraiser, very often on Capitol Hill. They invite their clients, they invite other people, and then they transmit the funds to a, a member of Congress. And from their perspective, uh, that helps them gain additional access to the process. They've done a favor through the fundraising process for a member of Congress, and, and, and that's, why, that's why they do it. Uh, and so what this amendment does is simply say, when you make your disclosures, which you already have to make with respect to your own contributions, to the extent you've solicited and transmitted a contribution to a member of Congress, you have to report those as well. And then do you make this report to the uh, Ethics Committee or to the FEC? Or? <coughs> this is to, this is as right, right now under existing law and many of the amendments to this bill in front of us, uh, there are existing disclosure requirements for, for lobbyists. And, this would just, as part of the regular report, that's already required under law. Okay, so this is to, this the, is not an to the clerk of the house. And Let me make it absolutely clear. This is not an additional report. It is an additional requirement as part of the existing report. That we so that would be apart and separate from what's reported at the FEC? Yes, this is under On their under disclosures law, or ours? Lobbyists have to make their disclosure reports uh, up here, uh, separate from any FEC that, report. Yeah. They don't have to, right now, they, they don't have Right now, lobbyists doesn't have to report anything to the FEC. Candidates report contributions they perceive to the FEC. What this would do uh, is say a lobbyist has to, in addition to disclosing their own individual contributions as part of the lobby disclosure report, which I believe is either existing law or part of the bill, it would simply, it would add the requirement that if they're bundling contributions and delivering them to members of Congress, they should report those. Okay, I, under I understand. I just wanted to clarify some of the practices. Mrs. Slaughter. I think it sounds like a very good idea. I hope it will be considered a second time. Thank you. Thank you, Bishop. Mrs. Matsui. Oh, yes. Uh, thank you for bringing this uh, once again. And uh, I'm sure you feel like it's uh, grand Groundhog Day again because you went through this process already on one committee. Uh, and it's when the committee is a jurisdiction on this, too. Um, it's a good amendment. And uh, I'm sorry it went missing. And I hope we can make it right by make it in order this time. So thank you very much for coming. Uh, Dr. Gingry. Chairman, thank you. And I, uh, Representative Van Hollen, I apologize. I came in, as you know, uh, maybe you didn't know because I'm behind you. <laughs> but, uh, and I read the amendment. I heard the, the end of your discussion. It, 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 it sounds like a, a good amendment. I, I, a lot of, we got 75, of course, <clears throat> including one of mine that uh, I'll get to in a minute. But I don't know, you know, which ones will be made in order, but I'm sure there will be a number of amendments on both sides of the aisle that are made in order. And certainly uh, from your side, uh, this is one of the better ones that I've heard over the last three or four hours. So thank you for bringing it to us. Well, I, I appreciate that. Thank you. And I know just to get back to uh, Mr. Capito's questions, I mean, we had a debate on, I mean, these, these questions were debated in the Judiciary Committee. And, uh, I'm not really there. Right. No, I know, but those those same kind of scenarios we went through, and I think by make by designing it and phrasing it the way we did, we were trying to make it both accomplish the intended purpose, but do it tightly enough so there weren't unintended consequences. I guess my biggest question was not understanding that it was solicit and transmit, and if you had to. This is where I had problems a little bit with the um, contact because I think you know we're all at 35A. I don't know if you are, but I am. I know Mrs. Slaughter is. Mrs. Slaughter. All the time. Right, and, and I understand that issue. Yeah. Right. 
Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Dr. Gingri, I believe you have an amendment. Yes. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. I, I appreciate the opportunity to present the amendment. <clears throat> We've had, what, uh, four, four different hearings uh, on the Rules Committee. We don't have uh, many original jurisdiction bills, at least not since I've been a member of the committee. Uh, but in the process of the testimony, we, we learned a lot. We, we have learned a tremendous amount, and I think there's been great bipartisan give and take. And, uh, I was very surprised that in, when I realized uh, by learning from one of the witnesses that gave testimony that political uh, action leadership committees, leadership PACs, uh, are not treated uh, in the same way as, your, as one's campaign committee. And of course, going back to 1980 and then I think finally in 1992, uh, where it was absolutely not permissible for a member uh, to leave this body uh, and convert a campaign committee <clears throat> balance, uh, whatever that amount might be, uh, to personal use. Uh, certainly it could be used uh, for continuing to contribute to uh, worthy candidates or donating to uh, a party committee or giving to charity or giving back to those to from, from whom the contributions came. Uh, but, but the PACs, the leadership PACs, who back in those days, I'm sure that was not, uh, uh, maybe not in vogue or not a, not a big deal. But it, it, Mr. Chairman, it really is a big deal today. And when you look at the, 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 the amount of money uh, in, in some of the leadership PACs on both sides of the aisle, uh, you're, you're talking about six and in some instances seven figure uh, balances. Uh, and I'm sure that members that, uh, in the recent past uh, in, in high levels, leadership positions, uh, whether they're in the minority or majority, uh, have, have utilized those, those uh, balances in the same fashion that the law has prescribed uh, in regard to campaign committees. But they don't have to. Uh, and the potential certainly is there for some miscreant. And as we, well, that's the reason, of course, we're here. <laughs> Uh, discussing this bill and the need for it that, you know, because uh, just a few, a very few, thank God, uh, members of, 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 a, of a body of 435, I think, mostly very uh, honorable and, and uh, uh, honest men and women of integrity, uh, we're having to do this. And so there's that possibility that there's, that, that someone, either by need or by greed, could be tempted uh, in leaving this body with a with a, uh, a leadership pack balance that, as I say, could be in the seven figures, uh, could, could convert that into personal use as as a a, a, a boat, a yacht, a condo, uh, or putting a child through college. And I think that's totally inappropriate. And what this amendment would do, and in, and of course the I'll quickly read the summary, extends the prohibition on converting campaign dollars for personal use currently applicable to campaign committees to leadership packs. Uh, a leadership pact is defined as a political committee which is directly or indirectly established, maintained, or controlled by a candidate for federal office or an individual holding federal office. So it's pretty straightforward, uh, and I, I commend it to my colleagues on the committee and be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Well, it is pretty straightforward. appreciate you uh, having uh, discovered that because I don't think it's commonly known, that, and, um, and you bringing it to... Uh, to our attention. Uh, any uh, questions, Mr. Capito? No. Slaughter? No, I, I didn't know that either. Bishop? <laughs> Matsui? Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Ms. Slaughter, I believe you have some amendments. Thank yes, thank you. Well, actually, it's a, an amendment in the nature of a substitute. Uh, the the uh, minorities uh, lobbying bill, and I'll run through it very quickly and uh, just leave it with you. Uh, it bans gifts, including meals, tickets, entertainment, and travel from lobbyists to non-governmental organizations that retain or employ lobbyists, prohibits lobbyists from funding, arranging, planning, or participating in congressional travel, and that's not in the present bill. Uh, regulates member travel on private jets. As I mentioned before, with change of mind here, 
Uh, the original bill said that we would have to disclose the cost and uh, reimburse, but we decided that the, well, uh, I think Democrats will not use the corporate check. Presidential Library funding requires public reporting of contributions to the organization, organizations established to raise funds for presidential libraries. And Mr. Chairman, we think this is much better than the bill we're going to vote on tomorrow. Well, Ms. Slaughter, I certainly appreciate you uh, bringing it forth and uh, explaining it in detail as you have. And, uh, Do you need it? Thank you. Thank you very much. Any questions uh, for our distinguished ranking member, Ms. Capito? Sure. That's the copy that was submitted, and that's the copy that we have. The change that I referred to on corporate jets, uh, since we haven't had time, to, you know, we missed the uh, amendment date, the time last night, but that will be incorporated by the Democrat caucus. So that's the only change? In that. That's the only change. Mm -hmm. Mrs. I'm sorry. We think that, because uh, we believe that's important in public interest as well. Uh, that's We don't want there to be any payoffs uh, or any quid pro quo or anything else in that in the in presidential libraries. No, it wouldn't. From here forward. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Matsui. Thank you. Mr. Bishop. We, what we understood, you know, we have the Inspector General in the House. What we were concerned about is that a figure was given to us that 
at times fewer than 5% of the lobbyists that are registered to lobby the Congress do any report at all. And there is precious little oversight over it and almost no penalty for not, uh, not enforcing that or not uh, complying with the reporting uh, provisions. And so we thought that we should set that up. We have not looked at any other body or any guidance on that. It's strictly what we think needs to be done in the House. We did not copy someone else? Is that what you're saying? No. Mm -hmm. Restraint of trade? I, I don't see it as restraint of trade. I, we see it as, as undue influence. Because the people who have just left still have some influence over the committees and the uh, uh, perhaps the ones that they chaired and the staff under who worked under them who may still be there. Uh, two years in many people's minds is not enough. Uh, but after four, three or four years, those uh, sets of characters have changed and we think it's better. But we, we don't believe anybody should walk out the door and then begin to lobby their colleagues. What is the next Oh, I, I think that this has been pretty obvious in many cases. I, I, don't, I don't particularly want to catalog one now, but we do know that there are people who served here uh, who still have very close uh, friends in, on the committee or members of staff who had worked with them uh, who look very favorably on what they are lobbying. Yeah, but if I'm like, if I'm like mm -hmm. question is so what? So what? Let me tell you why I, I said this before when we had the hearing. No lobbyist owes me anything in the world except information. It is then my obligation to get the information from the other side. Now, the public can't do that. We have to do that for them. It's got to be our obligation. I don't see the whole notion around here that somehow lobbyists are a special group of people who should be treated a, a, a gently. Uh, or the idea that if we do something to make them report, it has a chilling effect on the First Amendment. I really don't think that would ever hold up in court. So where is the I think it's bad government. Well, you're saying the responsibility of the member of Congress or the committee yes. member of Congress to be uh, discerning in their information, to gather all kinds of information possible, and then make judgment about it. Why should his opinion be more important than his opinion because of, an, because of a matter of two years? Look, the fact is, I, as I've also said before, no lobbyist can do anything up here that a member is not allowed or staff person, correct? Yeah. So we believe that uh, that we are going to help them along through that by saying that these people who are such close buddies and your friends are not going to be coming up here and asking you for any favors. Frankly, I'm not sure I remember member should lobby. That's a whole other issue. But I, I do find that there is a nexus between people who leave here and start, suddenly start to lobby. And even in surreptitious ways, and they may not go in have to come to the Capitol and do it, you and I both know that. You can do it anywhere, out the street. Which is one of the reasons that we want to do away with the business. Oh, okay. I'm, I'm still having the problems of, of well, trying I'm to sorry. understand whether. I, I think I believe Let me ask the first the first. for one year. Why one year instead of two? Yeah, why why have it at all? If the responsibility should be on the member uh -huh. to be discerning, as right. opposed to the lobbyist for being discerning, um, then maybe we should be dealing with the member's responsibilities rather than I some artificial figure. I think we do. I think that's what ethics is for, uh, and we do expect our members to live up to a certain standard. Uh, and I think that we need to expect the lobbyists to do the same. So why don't we just write a rule that says members will not be unduly influenced by somebody who has been there for less than, who has been lobbying for less than I a I wouldn't year. want members to be under the influence of anybody, Mr. Bishop. I hope that what they do is in the best interest of the people who sent them here. I've, I've appreciated this dance. Thank you, ma'am. It was a pleasure, a nice quadrille. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gingrey. Oh, oh. Next day. <laughs> if, if you have a question. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. I see my good friend, an uh, extremely respected member of this House, uh, Mr. Rogers of Michigan, if you'd like to testify. 
Thank you, Welcome. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Well, it's great to see you again. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I just want to highlight uh, an amendment that uh, I have before uh, the committee, and it really is, and, that, and first of all, let me back up and, and compliment the work here. I think there's been a lot of great input uh, about this great institution, and it, it is a great institution. It's been around for a long time. It's one of uh, uh, really the strongest, best democracies in the world. It's not perfect, uh, but I have yet to see one better. Uh, and I think at the end of the day, the work that you and your members will do here uh, will even make this uh, uh, a better place to work to serve uh, uh, in the service of the American people. I just want to talk about an issue of fairness that I think that we should address. I think it's important to address. Uh, and that is the fact uh, that in, in campaign finance reform, uh, we left a large loophole. If you're General Motors, uh, you need to form a PAC according to law and have your employees uh, through solicitations, you ask them to contribute uh, to that PAC so they can be involved in the political process. Uh, and PACs were designed to make sure that the system didn't run amok. You had to, it's very participatory in the demo, uh, a, a democracy. And there are limits on there to make sure that nobody has undue influence financially. So if you're the United Auto Workers, you're General Motors, you're MGM Grand uh, in Las Vegas, you are subject to these rules and regulations. But what we did is uh, exempted, really, uh, Indian gambling from that particular uh, rule under campaign finance. And when you look around uh, the, the uh, unfortunate scandal that happened here, it was the huge influx of gambling money. Uh, and really, the very lack uh, of rules and regulations. And many of those tribes were taken advantage of. Clearly, they were taken advantage of. And that happens when you have that much cash and that little regulation, uh, which is why we did in the past set these guidelines for giving and political action committees and how they uh, operate and full and complete transparency. So what we're saying is in this amendment, and by the way, one of the commissioners uh, agreed with this, this is a direction we need to go, is they, they too should be treated exactly like everyone else. Not any better, not any worse. Uh, if you're going to participate in federal elections, you should be subject to the Federal Election uh, Commission uh, rules, guidelines, and laws. That's really all this does. It would tell them that they had to uh, function uh, like every other corporation, uh, every other business in America, every other entity that wants to uh, uh, participate in this great democracy. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, I would uh, uh, yield. I just want to answer the one burning question that always comes up about sovereignty. Does this affect uh, uh, Indian sovereignty? And my argument is you just can't have it both ways. Canada is a sovereign nation. We also prohibit them from participating uh, in politics here in America. Uh, if you are going to participate in the federal elections in the United States of America, you should have to follow the rules, laws, regulations like everybody else. Uh, this is just about leveling the playing field. Given the recent history here, I think it's incredibly important that we do this. Thank you so much Thank for your you. hard work and bringing forward uh, uh, the product of your hard work and uh, your concern. Uh, thanks very much. Ms. Capito, any questions? Ms. Matsui? Oh. <laughs> any questions? Mr. Uh, Bishop? Dr. Gingrey? Thanks, Mike. Thanks I'll, for I'll take that as a, a strong yes, Mr. Bishop. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'd like to, uh, I'll, I'll brief, the chair will briefly recognize uh, himself. Uh, I have a, an amendment, uh, number 52 which seeks to um, uh, require uh, representatives, uh, whether uh, uh, registered agents or so-called uh, diplomats of uh, the handful of uh, uh, states that are on the um, uh, state-sponsored terrorism list as designated by the Secretary of State, uh, if they have contacts uh, with members of this branch of government. Uh, to report those uh, lobbying contacts to the Justice Department. And so uh, that in summary is what my amendment seeks to do. Um, if there are any, uh, if there are any, uh, if there are no more questions or comments at this point, uh, I would seek to, uh, I will close, we'll close the hearing portion of our meeting on H.R. 4975. Uh, and uh, we will, um, recess uh, subject to the call of the chair. Unfortunately, I don't know at this point 
I don't have an idea when the call will be. Uh, but we will uh, recess up to the call of the chair. Thank you. Thank you. Yesterday at the White House, President Bush joined some House members for a private briefing on Iraq. After that, congressmen spoke to reporters. 